Thank you. Hey, to wait here. 
Hello? Malo Lele, uh, and welcome everyone. We're about to start the Pacific Art Summit soon. I'd just like to introduce our Reverend Mao Vairua, followed by an Imeni Tuki by the Cook Island Presbyterian, Presbyterian Church uh, out in the heart. So, big round of applause for a Reverend. Thank you. Kiorana Tatu Katoto. E kamata i tu tato aka koro ngai roto tiera kuri tato ki te tu e to mato mi tu tapo i hoba i te rangi tete te tu kunai mato e te tu i mua i mato ka kamata i ta mato urade i roto i tiera e kiri roto au ka orong mai e reka reka i mata orang i mato kato tu i te kamata nga taiwa tu ki te aku tia nga amene ka kamete ki tato i tu tato a tu a naro i te reo i mene. Ate o mama e tu mama e tu tato i mene pati o e tato kato to tu mai tato ki ronga He te ga me ta ki No tato giro. I will speak my own language so that everybody will understand. How many Cook Islands in here? Put your hands up. Interpret it, what I say before you. Norea, Kiora, Natato, Kato, Toa, I Teroa, Ranu, Nui, Ote, Toa, I Roto, Tera. The Karangani, a power of Gitana, the Maji, get Chimotem. Kikore Koto, where Akono, Itago, Toto, a mo. The Kakitera, you two, a Toto, a mo, right up. Kara, a Chikaki, Unda, here. 
Naya suwe. We have to give it up. Orang. Naruto ite api yang. Naruto ite aku yang. Naruto ite tutu yang ite evangelia. Oh Yesus Mesia. Ini lah yang paling maya ini. Terakar terakar. Kya aku? Kya aku? Tato kato to. Ini lah yang paling maya ini. Tak minta kya yang ada tua. Kya aku? Eh tato kato to. Terah tak perlu yang kaki tene kita nak temui juga si motel. Aru kaki unai. Eh tak Yesus yang kaki te. Kutai unai aku kimiwa ite roro ote tangat nai. Eh unai kat tua iya ya. Imu ite roro. Ota kau metua, perita tu kita tu, let us pray. Tomato metua tapu. Tena de tua ngapoto te arara i emato iruto i tiara. Ia kematangan angmato iruto i aku i tetu. Nau itu nama itu baru tapu itu kita itu pakar iruto itu mato ngaku tata kita. Kiri roi rame pa. Tomari kita utara. Nau te ika kita rame pa tau utara itu mato ni bye bye. Sura mga ito mato ni Arata. Kiriro ti era, era marama no mato, era kaka. Iti aire nga naruto ita mato api. Te yako no ia, ete upa api iruto ti era. E baita tako e no mato kato to a iti ene. Yesu mato i puri atu e. Amen e. Tera te ia i akono i Yehova, ki a reka reka tātou, ki a pere pere kāwana. Warm greetings to everybody on this even warmer Wellington morning, and how wonderful it is to see all of your beautiful faces. Uh, thank you very much to our minister and to our community this morning for blessing our Pacific Art Summit at the beginning of day one. Uh, my name is Karen Rangi, and I'm proud to be here as the Chair of the Arts Council of New Zealand, Toi Aotearoa, along with my council colleagues to my left, our Chief Executive, and our CNZ team. And of course, with all of you this morning as we start a really important conversation for the Pacific arts world. Uh, that's one of the jobs I have to do this morning, and the second job I have um, with great pleasure is to introduce our next speaker. And um, before I do that, I just wanted to say how great it is to have so many people in the room, so many people that we are old friends and family, and people that we are yet to meet. So I encourage you over these three days as we have our important conversations together about the future of Pacific Arts, that we take the very rare opportunity to connect with each other face to face, uh, to enjoy being in the same room together, to eat together, to laugh together, to argue together, to dance together to our fabulous band over the right here, and to make the most of our collective thoughts and love and commitment to Pacific arts and culture. Thank you all of you for being here, and in particular to our next speaker. It is my great pleasure to welcome our Minister for Arts, Culture and Heritage, the Honourable Carmel Sipoloni. Tēnā koutou katoa tā lofa lava mā lōlelei. Whaka lofa lahi atu ki o rana, i o rana, tā loha ni, tā lofa, and how wonderful it is to be in a room with all of you again. Um, this is very much a prestigious room of people, uh, and I think we all feel blessed to be here. Uh, if I acknowledge you all by name, then I will far exceed the six minutes that I've been given to deliver a speech, and I've already been politely reminded by my Fijian sister, Ima Tavola, that it is a six-minute speech I'm supposed to be delivering. Uh, but I do need to start by acknowledging the giants that have steered our Pacific Arts governance vaka over many years. Uh, Albert Wendt, uh, Sefita Auli, Marilyn Kohasi, Lilia Walker, Dame Lua Manuval Winnie Laban, Fatai te le lava for your service. Karen Rangi, you follow in the footsteps of many Samoans and one honourable Tongan. Uh, but in true Cook Island style, you have stepped it up slightly by being the first Pacific person to chair 
what is now called the New Zealand Arts Council, Me Taki Mata. Tēnā koroa kuru i kura moiahu me Bonita Bingham, the co-chairs of the Arts Council's Committee Māori. I, I also acknowledge Stephen Wainwright, the Chief Executive of Creative New Zealand, our mamas and papas that are here today, our young people, our children, our Pacifica artists from around the motu representing our diverse community and cultural community, stakeholders and partners, Fafai Lava for being here today and for all that you all do. It is my great pleasure to launch the 2022 Creative New Zealand Pacific Art Summit as your Minister for Arts, Culture and Heritage. It's hard to believe that four years have passed since I stood in front of many of you for the opening of the 2018 summit. Little did we know back then what challenges lay ahead, not least of which was that small thing called a pandemic. I'll always remember one of my first COVID-related ministerial actions was to get on the phone to get our Auckland Pacifica Festival and Polyfest cancelled. It wasn't an easy message to relay, but it was undeniably the right decision. That was a sign of things to come with many events, performances, gigs, and creative collaborations all having to be put on hold. However, in your own ways, you all soldiered on. Music rang live through our online networks from garages and makeshift studios. Creative ideas were developed through Zoom collaborations Footage of dance performances came streaming into our homes. Some of you painted, worked on sculptures, wrote short stories, wrote scripts, wrote novels, and of course, wrote poetry. All of this reminds us that a global event of this magnitude may stop us from doing a lot of things, but it can't stop creativity. Despite COVID, so many great things have happened for the Pacific Arts since 2018. Along with acknowledging your resilience and fortitude, I also want to pay my respects to the team at Creative New Zealand and to the Arts Council. As Minister, I get to lay out my expectations and the areas that I deem to be priority, but they have to deliver on that. And I think it's been very clear that they certainly have. They worked with you back in 2018 to develop the first Pacifica Arts Strategy. Off the back of that strategy, we have seen the development and implementation of an incredibly broad range of opportunities for Pacifica artists. Hand in hand with this, a number of fresh avenues to acknowledge excellence and innovation have also opened up. There have been many impressive achievements that have come about following the strategy's implementation. And it is really important to pause and recognise some of these. In the global arena, new partnerships and collaborations are enabling our Pacifica artists and arts to connect across the Pacific and beyond. These include the new digital Moana Nui Akiva joint initiative between Creative New Zealand and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. This is the first formal agreement between the two agencies. This co-investment enables Pacifica artists in Aotearoa to collaborate and share skills and knowledge with fellow creators in the Pacific. I'd like to commend Makarita, our sister Makarita, wherever she is, and her team for thinking outside of the box and exploring new ways of investing in Pacific artists and communities, including through initiatives such as Boosted Ex Moana. <laughs> This collaboration with crowdfunding platform Boosted sees Creative New Zealand match private funding, enabling Pacific creatives to bring their art to life while growing a supported and activated community in the process. This is such a great innovative approach to funding that it is of no surprise to hear that Sports New Zealand has picked up on this and also now working with Boosted. Alongside the activation of hashtag digital moana, the Pacific Arts Strategy has also supported a number of other initiatives, far too many to mention, uh, but just a few I will mention today. A collaboration between the Gavette Brewster Art Gallery and the Len Lai Centre to support Pacifica Arts development and engagement in the Taranaki region. The new Arniva Arts Residency at Pataka Art Plus Museum for 
a Pacific artist or practitioner who identifies as LGBTQIA+, or MVPFAFF, in Pacifica communities. And the introduction of the Pacific Tour Art Award, recognizing the outstanding contribution of a Pacifica artist who lives with experience of disability uh, at the Creative New Zealand uh, Arts Pacifica Awards, a reflection of the sector's call, call to support our diverse communities. It is so wonderful to see Pacific Arts being celebrated in their own right more and more. And I believe it is indicative of a real coming of age for Pacific peoples more generally in Aotearoa, New Zealand. There is a genuine recognition of the economic, social, and general well-being benefits of our arts and the value that our Pacifica artists bring to that. We as Pacifica have always known that our arts, our culture, and our heritage are intrinsic to our well-being. Alongside the work of CNZ, I have a role to play in looking at how else the government can support our art sector to thrive. An obvious starting point for me was our Pacifica festivals. I want to acknowledge the $12 million my mate Grant Robertson signed off for supporting our festivals. Given the impacts of COVID that I mentioned earlier, it couldn't have come at a better time. CNZ then took up the challenge and not only divvied out money, but established a network of festival directors who are no longer working in isolation and can reap the benefits of the funding as well as the professional support. I also get excited when I see other arts institutions seeking out meaningful relationships with our Pacifica artists, like the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra's collaboration with the Pacific, more namely the Mana Moana Project. This will see a 50-strong Pacifica choir recording songs from the Pacific and with the NZSO, not only providing us with an amazing performance, but with the taonga of those recorded songs, uh, our Pacific choir with the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra. And I am so excited when I see how well our Pacific artists are performing here in Aotearoa, across the Pacific and internationally. Perhaps embodying all of those spaces is encapsulated in our first ever Pacific artist to represent us at the Venice Biennale this year, Yuki Kihara. And oh, how she represented. I am genuinely proud to be part of a government that respects the role of our arts and culture, and at the same time to be part of such a vibrant and amazing Pacifica community. The next three days provide a vital opportunity for Pacific artists from all stages in their creative careers to funnel with other artists, arts organisations and stakeholders and to strengthen that Pacific arts bar. As well as taking time to reflect on the outcome of Creative New Zealand's first Pacific arts strategy, a key part of this summit is to look to the future. This is the time for some really open dialogue and I encourage everyone to have their say. I'm immensely proud of our Pacific art sector, its achievements and its potential. I started this speech by acknowledging the governance of Creative New Zealand and it would be remiss of me not to mention the leadership and support of the Ministry for Culture and Heritage. Uh, they have had the task of uh, responding to our art sector over what has been a very turbulent time. Half a billion dollars in the recovery package uh, that We've had to make decisions about with regards to how best we can respond to the needs of our artists in the art sector. Uh, and I want to congratulate them for the work that they've done. I look forward to working with our first ever Pacific Chief Executive of the Ministry of Arts, Culture and Heritage, the first Pacific Chief Executive of any government agency in Aotearoa outside of the Ministry for Pacific Peoples, Laulu Mac Leao Anai, and no, <laughs> there was no conscious or unconscious bias in the um, selection of that chief executive. Uh, just like each and every one of you, the best person for the job. And another step forward for our community. Many, many more to come. Partai lava malo apito.
Kia ora na katoa, i nga hui whā, no mai haere mai ki te papa tonga rewa. I'm Chris Stephen Wainwright, a hau ki pau whakarai o tonga o te roa. Um, it fills my heart with joy to see you all here. Um, and I love coming into um, the gallery from the top because uh, it reminds me of our place in the world. Uh, my ancestors came to uh, Pitoni in the 19th century <coughs> and uh, we've made the short trek to the capital since then. But I love to look out over the Moana up to the Hutt Valley and think about that everyone came here to make a better life for themselves in this country. And in this role at Creative New Zealand, we're all interested in making a better life for artists and communities across the country. And our co-papa here, of course, um, is Pacifica Arts. And I really want to thank you all for taking time out of your lives to be here and help us do some important work. Somebody once said that the purpose of the arts is to acknowledge the past, present the present, and audition the future. And although we're a young nation, that job of auditioning the future is a critically important one. And one of the ways that we do that is we do these things called strategies. But all that really means is, what do we want to do next? And so many of you and I want to acknowledge the whakapapa of Pacific Arts and so many champions of the Pacific Arts that are here in this room um, that have done such a vital job to bring us to this point. But we're always looking to the horizon. So we've done that first Pacific strategy and you'll hear later about what I think is a pretty transformative impact of that work. And now we're ready for the next leg of that journey. And we can't do it alone, or we could do it alone, but it wouldn't be nearly as good as doing it with you. So before we get to the huckery on Thursday night, there's quite a lot of hard work to do, and I look forward to you helping us shape the next leg of that journey around our work to uplift the Pacific Arts here in the South Pacific. No mihi kia koto. We'll have a way after now. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to now introduce the rest of the CNZ Fano. So if I could please call my fellow Arts Council members and members of their senior leadership team up onto the stage. And actually, you can introduce yourselves. Talofa lava, bolovinaka, 
Kia ora nga, mahalo, mā lola nei, whakalopa lahi atu. Ko wetu, whala tuku ingoa, uh, he kai auaha ahau, me te tihi me mahau o te kaunihira o Aotearoa. My name is Wetu Fala. I'm a creative, and I'd like to acknowledge our kaumātua here and thank the minister for recognising the work that they have done for us. And I'd also like to do a shout out to my own Pasifika colleagues who over the last 35 years supported me. Patui Umanga, Piplo Fiso, Nat Lees, and Susanna Leatawa. Noreira, Hurinoi Te Fare. Enjoy the Pacific Summit. Tena koto kato. I think it's me. Uh, oko okore, ke o hufanga, henga hi whakatapu. Uh, ko o osi hono a whaki. Kaya tā ki a te au uh, ke o whakahoko atu ai tine motuani. Ko hoku hingoa, ko ane Elisiva kenohoe tonga. Ko eku whae mei baini, ko eku tamai mei. Uh, uh, it is so wonderful to see you all here. Um, my name is Anne. I joined the Arts Council Board in November last year. Very honoured to do so and to follow the footsteps of Dame Lua Manavau. Only Laban, there was a very big shoes to fill. I'm trying, we're doing it, but I'm very, very happy to be here. Uh, Morena, warm Pacific greetings um, for John, John Ong Aho. Uh, I've been on the Arts Council for three years now. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Minister and Dame Winnie, of course. Um, I'm just absolutely delighted to see everyone here today. Um, I'm really excited about the next three days. It's going to be a fantastic conversation. I'm just, just really looking forward to it. So thank you very much. Tēnā tātou katoa, ko ai tēnei, ko hane ko te kura tātou ku inoa. Uh, I te puake au i roto i a tūhoi, i rua tāhuna. Nā reira tūhoi, mau mau kai, mau mau taonga, mau mau tāna taki te poe. Nei rā te noho whakaiti ki ngā iau koutou. E nā kau mātua, nā kuia, ko hara mai nei te tautoko i te rā nei, i nā, um, nā rā tēnei rā te whakaiti i ngā iau koutou katoa. I runga i te kaupapa, ana i te mahere rautaki ko aike mai nei tātou. Hello, my name is Angus Everson. I work at Creative New Zealand. I'm the business services manager there. And I've had the, the real pleasure of being working for Creative New Zealand for 17 years and uh, enjoying just about every day. Have a lovely uh, couple of days here. Look forward to the outcomes of what you're going to do. See you. Kia ora koutou. Ko Gretchen LaRoche, uh, taku ingoa. Um, uh, I am the Senior Manager, Arts Development Services, and uh, Makarita suggested that we say something a little bit about ourselves, uh, what we were doing before we joined Creative New Zealand, which for me is only, I only joined a few weeks ago. Um, I'm a musician, a clarinet saxophone player mostly, um, and prior to working as a performer, um, I also worked in the music sector pretty much all my life, um, most recently Chamber Music New Zealand and Christchurch Symphony Orchestra before that. Tēnā tātou te whare, uh, ko Paula Kā tōku ingoa, hi rua hau noa taranaki maunga, taranaki whenoa, taranaki tangata. Uh, tēnā kātou. Um, my name is Paula and I'm on the senior leadership team with my colleagues here. Um, during the day I'm senior manager for Māori Strategy and Partnerships. Um, and when I'm not working at Creative New Zealand, I'm the chair of one of the southern niwi and taranaki, Ngā Ruihine. Tēnā tātou. I'm the Senior Manager of Strategy and Engagement at Creative New Zealand. Uh, I have the great privilege of work and pleasure of working alongside Makareta and our beautiful strategy uh, project team as we work towards the next five-year strategy. So that keeps me relatively busy. Kia ora. Salofa and Makareta Urale. Savai born, Samoan from the arts, uh, been at Creative New Zealand, was my first job, still there. 
uh, and it's uh, second Pacific Art, I think fourth Pacific Art Summit, uh, going all the way back from being an emerging artist. Uh, thank you, it is beautiful to see you all here. Uh, we've got a lot of work for the, uh, to do for the next couple of days uh, for our Arts Council at Rangatira uh, to listen to what our Pacific Arts community wants for the next five years as, uh, as part of our strategy. So uh, lots of love and aloha. Uh, there's lots of food, lots of kai. I hope you're not on a diet, but um, <laughs> uh, thank you to our papa there for, for the uh, words of uh, devotion this morning. Thank you to our uh, band there, Dougie from Kurirua. Uh, welcome to our disabled arts community. Fati Umanga, thank you. Uh, uh, Lucy Fiver, award winners. We have many of our master heritage artists here from around the country, uh, former members of our Pacific Arts Committee and our governance, and most of all, our artists. Uh, uh, we hope you enjoy the next few days. Uh, thank you for being here. And uh, how long have I been a senior manager? Uh, senior manager of Pacific Arts about 18 months ago. So still learning, still a grasshopper as I call it. And I want to shout out to my sister here, Irelia Ifupo. So, uh, uh, director, playwright, producer, she's been beside me working in operations on staff for about 10 years, running our awards events, which is this Thursday. Uh, worked on the last summit, but founder, co-founder of Pacific Underground, and they just put on the Dawn Raid show in Auckland. So. Lots of love and aloha. Thank you to all our beautiful Creative New Zealand Fano and team here, Pacifica Queens everywhere. So we're here to uh, tautua you and serve you and make sure that we get to listen to you uh, for the next few days to decide where our waka is going to go for the next five years. Malo e Manuele Fono. Me taki kōrereka team, you may go. Um, just want to encourage you for the next three days. You've seen who our council members are, who our senior staff members are. Please have conversations with them, share your thoughts and your views about Creative New Zealand and about our work. Um, so now I'm going to hand you back to the uh, wonderful Makarita. And Makarita, I wanted to say uh, an extra thank you to you for taking on my daughter as a school holiday job to learn, to learn um, by being around fabulous people. So Makarita, over to you. So I hope you've got all your programs uh, that you've got on the table that uh, lays out what we're doing on day one of the summit today and then day two. Now, one of the th uh, just a quick note, at our last summit we asked our community what their feedback was and they said they didn't know who Creative New Zealand was. So that's what we're doing today to make sure we you get to see the te of our, uh, you can see all our beautiful uh, Fano, our Arts Council members, our executive team, and you'll meet more of the staff here as well as our CEO. Uh, so thank you, Minister, again for your beautiful speech this morning. Um, this panel on your program, I don't know, hopefully we're sticking on time. 10.05, oh my God, we better hurry up. Oh no, it's 10.03. No, we've done it, we're 10. We're running seven minutes early. Right. <laughs> if you're looking at your program, we're now on to the Kamuri Kamoa, and it is an incredible honor. I feel quite emotional doing this because uh, today is about the ngafa, the whakapapa, the senate of our Pacific Arts community. It goes back many, many years. Many are not here. Uh, uh, there are many people who have uh, pioneered, uh, who've spoken on our behalf, and today we're speaking for those in the future coming. And uh, I have the great pleasure of facilitating our next panel, our first panel for the day. Uh, and we have uh, Sefita Hauli, a former member of the Pacific, uh, former chair of the Pacific Arts Committee. Uh, uh, Marilyn Kolhase. Marilyn was the chair of the Pacific Arts Committee for many years, uh, Pele Walker. <laughs> and the queen of them all, Lord Manavao Dame Winnie Laban. <laughs> Great. Oh, yeah. So, you can take your seats. 
Thank you. Now, for our summit this week, it's looking at what does our Pacific Arts community want for the next five years. There's only so much money. Uh, there are a lot of things the government wants to spend money on. Back in the day, uh, and uh, these chairs of the Pacific Arts Committee, under the legislation uh, that set up uh, what has now become the Arts Council and Creative New Zealand, they led members of the Pacific Arts Committee representing our seven different Pacific Island countries. And they developed policy. They uh, worked on budget. They did many strategic things. So what we want to ask them, uh, back in the day, what did you dream of for Pacific Arts in the future? And uh, what are some of the things that you're most proud of? I'm going to move it to Sefita. Albert Wendt was the chair of the Pacific Arts Committee from 1995 under the 95-4 le legislation. So Albert was there after Albert went. Uh, Albert couldn't be here uh, today. It was Safita. So I'll ask Safita to go first and share with us what he dreamed of for Pacific Arts in the future. Uh, thank you, Makarika. Roe, all the Fata Poeniki, Hafangan, the Roma Makina for Hiko Hilaki Mista, Tama, Tonga Moto. Fanau at Pacific Gio Kui Tau in New Zealand. Uh, also, welcome to my fellow board members today. Um, of course, uh, Marilyn, I've known for quite some time in Pele. Uh, Margarita, you've, um, you've given me a bit of a hospital pass <laughs> because the man who should be sitting here, uh, you all know, need no introduction, um, one of our foremost. Uh, writers um, in Albert Wynn. Can I just say that <laughs> that joining Albert Wynn after he's done this job, uh, if many of you are not plumbers, you will know that joining plastic to brass is never easy. <laughs> Albert being brass, and uh, as many of you would know that before he took up the, the position of chairman within the arts board, Albert had always been, um, I can use the word abrasive for one of a better description, but that is what was needed at the time in order to get things done, in order to be listened to, and coming from somebody who's respected by the arts community made life a lot easier for the rest of us who were able to follow. Um, as minister will know, uh, Appointments like uh, being to the chair often requires some political maneuverings and some community input and a recognition that those decisions are always scrutinized by the whole community. So for Albert to being first made it a lot easier because he established a position for uh, Pacifica Arts which first and foremost respected the Tangata Finua's role in the arts in New Zealand. It actually helped me as a, um, as a follower uh, to understand, if you like, the kaupapa at Creative in New Zealand. Uh, we were small, we were tiny, we were insignificant, but we did have big dreams, Minister. So, Margarita, perhaps I can pass it on from then on because I think right. there'll be a lot more to say. Um, but I want to acknowledge Albert's role in being the first and foremost, the forerunner, who actually set the stage for those of us who followed and made life a lot easier for us. My so, we're, look, we're looking at the mid-90s, late-90s for the stream that started happening there, and there were many others before. So, over to you, Pele. So, to state the era that you, oh, we'll go with Marilyn. Go, Marilyn. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. No, no, I don't want to um, get a hide. Sorry for Marilyn. jumping in here, but I was the next chair after Sefita. But I, um, uh, I also want to acknowledge Takiora Ingram, who was the chair prior to me for a very short time. Mm. And she um, set up the Cook Islands residency 
in cahoots with um, the former chair of Te Wakatoi, Elizabeth Ellis. So, and that is an example of how closely we have worked with uh, Tangata Whenua in Creative New Zealand, which was important. So, Tena Koto Kato and Moana, greetings to all of you beautiful people here. I'm so somewhat overcome to be on the Matua panel, but I am indeed honoured to join my colleagues to share our dreams and strategies for the then future of Pacific Arts in Aotearoa. My six year appointment to the CNZ Art Board, Arts Board was from 2001 to 2006. I'm not an artist at all, but my creativity extends to cooking and arranging flowers. But I did have a, but I did have a Pacific um, Arts Gallery in Auckland, Okai Authentic Art, for a few years. Two people from Helen Clark's government knew me from the trade union movement, work I did in the 80s, as did Sepita, actually, and from growing up in Glen Innes, or GI, for those of you from Auckland. They knew I had the leadership experience, advocacy skills, and commitment as a first-generation New Zealand born of Ger German Samoan parentage. The Pacific Arts Committee was a subcommittee of the former CNZ Arts Board. Over my six years, the Pacific Arts Committee members were a fantastic group drawn from visual artists, musicians, curators, heritage artists, performing artists, composers, with, an, with one academic and one broadcaster thrown in, and a writer. They represented the Cook Islands, Fiji, Niue, Tokelau, and Tonga, arts professionals with thin on the ground there. And, and I list those island nations that we came from because now, 21 years later, there is a much broader uh, involvement of all the, of the Moana nations in Creative New Zealand, which is fantastic. Yes, under our current Pacific Arts strategy, we expanded from Polynesia to be inclusive of our uh, whānau in Micronesia and to the Melanesian, uh, our Melanesian nation. So our families just got bigger around our Pacific strategy. So thank you, Marilyn, for that. For that. This is a whakapapa <laughs> lesson. 21 years ago, there were only two institutional curators, Fulimaro Pereira and Sean Mellon, and CNZ had just one Pacific staff member, Anton Carter. And guess what the Pacific Arts budget was? $130,000 for the whole year. We split this into two funding rounds. Certain applications that met arts board criteria, such as Black Grace, Mao, and Style Pacifica, etc., went to the arts board. But the, for example, the Enduring Pacific, Christchurch Pacific Underground, got a maximum back in those days of ten thousand dollars for their programs from the Pacific Arts Committee. Our dreams were focused on getting more. So our clear task was to advocate for increased funding and another staff member. Plus, most significantly, the development of a Pacific Arts infrastructure to build internal expertise. At the end of my tenure, one extra staff member for Auckland was agreed to. As a Pacific Arts Committee, we met as just us and Anton. Other staff would come to meet us after a lunch and we, we lobbied very hard. Do you remember those days, Stephen? <laughs> yes, he was in charge of the money in those days. And so he has delivered with more money from prompting from others such as Winnie Leyburn. Um, so Steph I, I want to mention Stephanie Oberg, a, a writer, curator from Christchurch, because she, like many others, was particularly fierce in her um, advocacy but in her very gentle, charming Cook Island way. So we selected applications we wanted to fund and allocated amounts. At the meeting's end, Anton had to keep shaving off $1,000 here, $500 there, $100 here on the whiteboard list so that we could manage that round of our pathetic $75,000. It was always heartbreaking. Of course, of course, artists applied repeatedly, being declined three or four times, as there was just not the budget. 
One of those was Fijian Darren Kamali, who I knew as a Cairo busker. And he's recently received 75,000 for his Ulukavu project. While he has gone on to gain postgraduate qualifications, many of the artists 20 years ago had not been to art school, as the majority today have. And so what difference has this made? I've been reflecting and talking with Anton Carter recently, and particularly on what the ideological shift from the old Queen Elizabeth Arts Council to Creative New Zealand has brought us. Has that ideological shift from arts to creative, what's it meant? And what are the role of the Ministry of Culture and Heritage? As Moana peoples, we are still operating in a colonial framework in the arts and glam sector. For the future, we need visionary Moana thinkers, artists, and practitioners to weave strategies to enhance the extraordinary talents of our artists for the future, because you are our political voice. Here we are now with a well-resourced Creative New Zealand team of seven Pacifica people with a budget of millions. And whilst our one staff member was an advisor, a mere advisor, uh, he did more, Margarita Urali is now on the senior management team. There is a summary of achievements in the background papers for this third summit. The growth and achievements of the last 15 years are more than we could have dreamt of. Marlo Lava to my colleagues here and to the others who made this happen. Thank you, Marilyn. Well, that was a history lesson. And, uh, you know, I'm proud to say, listening, hearing it from the chair of the Pacific Arts Committee, you know, in Marilyn's era, it wasn't that long ago, uh, but oh, from 2000 to 2006, I think, was your era as chair, uh, as part of the infrastructure of governance at, at Creative New Zealand. Um, now, uh, hearing that, you know, just in terms of money terms, it, it you know, uh, work has been done. A lot of work has been done uh, in terms of money-wise, but now it's moving beyond just money, dollars, and looking at the cultural concepts under our current strategy, which you helped the Arts Council create. Va, what is the va? Uh, the tangata, uh, vaka, and the moana nui akiva concepts. Those are kind of the complexity of the thinking now that's required beyond just the dollar. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, please, uh, now over to Pele to talk about some of the, uh, the vision. Uh, Pele was chair for a long time, and uh, in that period too, we've got Emma Tavola there, who at that era of Pele's chairmanship and leadership was uh, on the board of the Pacific Arts Committee. Hui uh, Maono uh, Carl was there. Many of the artists here were part of that, uh, of that mahi. So, Pele. Not used to being on the stage. But um Talo Falava, uh Maestro C Minister um, Stephen Karangani and my fellow chair. It is um it's a little bit overwhelming and um to to be here, to sit out um mm. to be on the stage and to see all of you artists and to recognise and reflect on where we've come from. My period as chair of the Pacific Arts Committee was 2006 to 2013. Um, it was Lua Manaval who rang me one day and said, would I be chair? And I said, how can I possibly do that? I don't know anything about Pacific Arts. But I looked on the website and I saw my committee. I saw the seven members that represented the main island groups in those days and I thought, that's where the strength lies, that's where the wisdom and the subject matter expertise lies and all I ever had to do over all of that time was to listen to them and to be their voice. So when I joined, uh, I dreamt of growing that Pacific Arts dollar, I followed Marilyn, and of not being constrained by the budget, th the budget that the Pacific Arts Committee had I wanted to a Pacific Arts infrastructure that could support itself. 
when I look here today, and I know that that's been achieved in many ways. I wanted us to be more than just the, not just, I wanted us to be more than the focus on the standout individual performers that we had to a body of career artists, for us to nurture and grow a wave of savvy, multi-skilled multi artists who had universal appeal, and we know that now, absolutely, and a mature profile of artists and a Pacific Arts infrastructure that was very, the infrastructure is very, very important because that's where you get your longevity. There were just two organisations funded from the General Arts Fund in 2006. That's today's equivalent of Totara and um, Kahikatea. They were Total and Black Grace. Total at that stage was at risk and red stickered. Do you remember that too? <laughs> and, um, and Black Grace. Um, Yosefa Inari had just been employed part time as a dance advisor with dance. And his vision, of course, was Pacific Dance. Uh, Killer Coconut Crew were just, we had just done a performance at Bats, and um, you know where, where Tanya and Foss have been doing, what they've been doing in the interim. When I left, Killer Coconut Crew, Pacific Dance, Tawata Productions, and the Conch had been added to that group of the equivalent now, Kahitea. Yeah. A Pacific Dance. And funded outside of the Pacific budget. Yeah. And we had 40% more of funding to Pacific Arts than in 2006. And we had the beginnings of a growing Pacific infrastructure. We were starting to support producers, Pacific producers, directors, administrators. We have that structure now, I think. Professional, sustainable arts organisations who have been there for the long haul. And again, I say Pacific Dance, Kia Mau, Black Grace, The Conch. And many, many of you artists who in your own right, Emma has a gallery, has galleries, um, production companies, Tanya, all of those. So that, that's what my dream was. I think my dream has pretty much, it's there. Yay. Thank lover. you. We'll pass it on. We'll pass it on to hear from uh, Lord Monoval, uh, Winnie Laban. So uh, uh, in 2014, the government passed a new act. It was uh, revoked the previous 1995 legislation. And what it did, there used to be a huge arts council, no, arts council of five people, I think, one Māori on that, on that council. Then there was a general board, a Te Wakatoi Māori board, and underneath the general board was this little Pacific Arts Committee uh, that they chaired and made such a difference. The chair did sit on the board of the uh, general arts board anyway, so they had a voice at that table, all of them did, were members of that board. In 19, 2014, uh, and I know many of the community did provide submissions for the government, uh, a new act was passed. Uh, the Toy Aotearoa Act 2014, and that disestablished the Pacific Committee, the Te Wakatoi Board, the General Board, and it simplified to what is now called the Unitary Council. So the legislation, what's really fantastic, specifically states that uh, the Arts Council of New Zealand must uh, support the arts of the, of the people of the Pacific Islands, must support Māori arts, must support advocacy, I think, community arts, for the benefit of all New Zealanders. So we have to be inclusive and there's lots of our whānau. And in that space, obviously, we've got our disabled arts community who need that voice, all our different little island groups that are smaller compared to the Samoans like me. <laughs> but uh, so that's the sort of the context. What happened in 2014, so Pele, Pele uh, the committee, we had a lot of cry. Karen Rangi was there. And Lua Manuval, uh, I think just before that, for the tw last 12 months, Lua Manuval became the chair. And Karen Rangi was already on that, was on that Pacific Arts Committee as a final member. So this is the whakapapa of our story. And I just want to say thank you, Mele Went, sister in front of there. We spoke because her dad couldn't be here, but she's here on his behalf. So thank you, Mele. So uh, we'll just hear from Lua Manuval what her dream was. E mō mō te whātū lau atu i le pai a lasi lasi o a whātasi mai. Uh, me sa bolo vanaka, good day true, halo o beta, whakamu whalahi atu, 
and warm Pacific greetings and all the sacred genealogies and histories and languages and cultures that you all represent. My contribution uh, as Matua, it's a southern elevation, <laughs> um, is to come to pay tribute to the artists because you are the soul, you are the spirit, you're the passion as to why we get these roles to ensure the funders, the politicians are on track. And I've decided to bring poetry uh, to my voice uh, this afternoon and I wanted to open with Carlo Mila, Carlo Mila's poem and it's a tribute to Albert Wendt on his birthday. You dare to fish beyond the coral reefs of our understanding. Your net pulls in poems, flicking salty tales. You find nua nua in the eye of hurricanes. Celebrate thunder we prefer not to hear and relish the quicksilver laughter of lightning. You shake the tree of the frangipani, and as the flowers fall from grace, you string them into sentences, ants and all. Your narrative is a needle that pierces the thickest skin. The ink of your pen blending with our blood tattooing stories of altered genealogy between the lines of our naked bodies. I wanted to pay tribute to, to our people and I brought a few books to show you that uh, we didn't just start in the present. Oceanic art, art in Oceania started from our ancestors many thousands of years ago. And many of you honor and pay tribute, <laughs> pay tribute to that. The second one is ancestry, genealogy, ngapa, fa'utenga, ngapa. You know, like the minister said, it's very important you know who you are and where you come from. So genealogy, whakapapa, didn't just start with the present. It started a long time ago and started with each and every one of you and all of us. Then this is one of Albert's stories books, The Birth and Death of the Miracle Man, and I can say Miracle Woman as well, <laughs> and, uh, and other stories. You know, this is just a little taste of the wonderful work that each and all of you do for us. You are us and we are you. This is my tribute to you. We were simply there with those roles to work with Creative New Zealand to work with the politicians and I wanted to honour Helen Clark when she was Prime Minister. She had Ministry of Culture and Heritage. She came along and put big funding into the arts. I also wanted to honour ministers like Chris Finlayson. You know, we've got to play bipartisan who actually put me on the Arts Council and then Carmel renewed uh, my membership. And um, the role of politicians around funding Pacific Arts and Pacific Voice and Pacific Leadership. I also wanted to honour the Arts Council and also Creative New Zealand under the leadership of Stephen Wainwright. Thank you to all of you because you've all contributed alongside us to serve our artists. That's what governance and all these roles and the various labels that come with are about. We each have the interests of our Pacific at heart because the legacy and the agenda was set many thousands of years ago by our ancestors from Melanesia, Polynesia and Micronesia. And here today we pay a tribute to them. We pay a tribute to the past, to the present and to the future. 
So I just wanted to end this, this one to this final poem. Carlo Mila, you can see I'm a huge fan of her, of her. And uh, this is a tribute, a tribute to the artist. You carry the beauty of where we came from in your body. The white of the kotuku, a wild streak in your hair. Speaking mana like memory to tired ears. Ancients clear your path, you hold your head high. For every bowed head, you carry the pain of our silences in your spoken word. With blood, we alter the face of this nation with every birth. Our whenua buried in these green pastures, Pulutu still sings across the sea. A sacred skimming chant calling the tatau encoded deep beneath your skin. Unlocking tongues and prayers of the past. It is a conversation between ocean and history, genealogy and bones. It is a thin umbilical line through time that pulls us reaching between destiny and memory. We are navigating a new constellation mapped deep in your bones, an ocean of islands united. You dream us a sea of stars at our feet. O falahi kalo, o falahi to you all. We love you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So we've got another about 10 more minutes of this panel, and then we're just going to give them um, a beautiful lay, and then after that we will have our uh, a waiata and a morning tea, and then we'll get, get, get into the rest of the program. Thank you. I hope that was really insightful. Um, help us to settle and ground ourselves in our, in our Senate and Nangafa of our many histories that go all the way back. Questions. So the next question, I think, would be really interesting because this is the work that our Pacific Arts community are here to do, uh, together with Creative New Zealand, our many communities. Also, I just want to shout out to uh, Seita Lofa, to Reverend Tuamalia there, uh, who's also been there serving our community for many years, our Tuvalu community. So, um, again, I think what would be of interest, I think, might be what, what are some words of wisdom in your leadership for uh, the arts in the space that you might be able to share with us, our artists here, perhaps some of our younger, uh, younger and emerging artists as well. Yeah, over to you, Professor. Uh, I want to touch on a couple of things just very quickly. Uh, what is becoming um, obvious today, many of our uh, Pacific countries are trying to develop their own disciplines in the arts. And I know that um, some of the most fantastic art comes from being in discipline. What I'm talking about is that in Samoa, Fiji, and Tonga next year, they're going to start um, tertiary institution, university, so to speak. One of the, um, uh, the concerns that I have when this happens, and the touching on language, which is a very uh, core part of our being, is also a core part of our artistic expression. The death of our languages in the Pacific is a major issue which will have some impact on how we practice our arts. Um, I believe that, that some of us have found a, a solution to guaranteeing that our languages will live and we do this by actually following the examples of what we call the powerful languages that exist in the world. English being number one, 
Um, Hindi and Mandarin are, are very, very strong too, but they practice mainly in their own countries, Spanish, German, and French. I'd like to be able to say Tongan, Te Reo, and, and Te Kukihara Ni Reo as part of that as well, but I'm hoping that they will be in. And uh, just very quickly, here is something that we should dream about as part of dreaming through our arts and bringing our Pacific and the, the core languages into being. If we could aim to teach the total curriculum from primary school or from preschool all the way to university, that will guarantee us the survival of our language forever. Because what that will do is that to create the vocabulary that is so uh, missing today, we will import words as English have done, they've brought in uh, from Anglo-Saxon, from Latin, from Greek, and call it their own. We need to actually grow our language where it's supposed to be, that's in Samoan in Samoa, Tongan in Tonga, and hopefully for the rest of the Pacific to follow. But here's the crunch though. If our languages are not going to be academic languages, that will guarantee its death. So let's make that an art, the art of growing our language through our writings, through our thinking, but also lobbying Samoa, Tonga, and Fiji to teach our universities in our language, not exclusively, but included of any other language that will come. So it will have some prominence. It will have the, the prime place in our academic world. So New Zealand has been very, very good at actually offering us opportunities to develop our languages here but it's only very limited. If it isn't um, thriving in Samoa, if it's not thriving in Tonga, if it's not thriving in Fiji, it will die. So I'm asking that we recognize that through the arts and through your efforts, whether it be music, whether it be writing, to remember that if there is a role for our languages, the aim is to make our language an academic language in where it's born. If we don't do that, I'm afraid it will die. That's my challenge for what I read through here. And if you could include that as part of the thinking, I think we will all be the better off for it. Thank you. Thank you, Savita. Uh, so obviously, as some, a Samoan speaker, I was born in the, my dad's village in Pangamalo. I spoke Samoan. When I came to New Zealand, I to speak, learned to speak English and then learned te reo Māori and French at school as well. So. Obviously, I was just laughing to myself, thinking, gosh, we've got a four strategic po tangata vaka va moana. It would be so different if it was like, in English, which is like person, boat. I wouldn't even know how to translate va. And then what would moana be? It's like sea. It would be really different, wouldn't it? So this is why language is, it encapsulates our concepts and our way of, uh, our worldviews. Yeah. And I just want to put an ad there that Ministry of Pacific People have just released their uh, National Pacifica Strategies Languages, which I'm really proud of. Uh, that uh, we'll, we'll, have, we'll try and get some copies so everyone's got a copy here to help our languages grow. Thank you. Uh, so, Marilyn, words of wisdom? Uh, I just want to, to add to what Savita has said, because in Fiji Language Week, I was hearing on the radio about how important that language was for the maintenance and growth of our heritage arts. And one of my, um, what do you call those things, uh, short things to say when I was at Creative New Zealand being interviewed by the media, is that our heritage arts are the source for us. We must honour our heritage arts. So keeping our language alive is absolutely fundamental for our collective future. You will see that um, the Chamorro of Guatemala, is it what, not Guatemala, Guam, Guam. Guam. Who, are, who are looking to rediscover their language to correct with their, their heritage arts. So I would just like to say that last week on The Big Idea, I was reading um, 
the hint of Sefton Rani, who is a Cook Island artist in Auckland. And he had a huge list of hints for artists. And the thing that sta stays in my mind is make art every day. Just keep doing it. these two. Um, really, it, the, the language and the making the art, but it's also the telling of the stories, and you know that as artists, that's what it is all about. It's telling our stories, and just the growing strength there is in telling our stories. Um, Dawn Rays, as one recent really, really powerful example, the stories that we know, telling them the way that we want them to be told the way that we need them to be told and to really pushing other sectors of the communities that we live in to really acknowledge and see the world that we live in. Thank you, Billy. I think art and genre comes in all languages. It's about inclusion. So it is important to know your languages of origin but equally English and expression of us is important. So to the young artists, dream big, be bold. Just carry on the legacy that we've honoured today and uh, ensure that you're paid to do it. Thank you. Um, any last words before we wrap up to our panel? Last words. Um, there will be a lot more to, to have to say, um, Margarita, but I, I do appreciate the fact that you were able to bring these um, people together, where we're able to meet minister, CEO, the rest of your staff, and for those of us who uh, did our little to make a contribution to what we are today, forever grateful. I see some of my uh, ASBO members here, like Emma, and there are others, but I'm particularly uh, grateful that you've created a forum where decision makers, supporters, and the practitioners are in the same room. A wonderful idea. Thank you. That's great. Papatai um, Lava. Any last words from you, Billy? Marilyn? Actually, actually, I wanted to thank you, Margarita, as well. Yeah. Oh, well, thank um, you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> cool. You know, for, for very, very many, many reasons. Um, but I think, and you've been inter interjecting with some of the things that we've said, because you think outside the box, and you've done that for Pacific, you Pacific Arts, and you're doing a really wonderful job. I also want to thank, I, you know, members of the committee over the past years that I can see through here. We have only ever been your spokespeople. Thank you. Thank you. Round of applause. Thank you. We're now just going to present um, a gift. Uh, uh, this is our first panel. We've got more uh, to go for the rest of the day. So we're just going to present a gift and just invite Millie Went uh, on behalf of her dad um, to come up here. Thank you, Millie. Yeah. So Millie's got to say something, of course. My Lord, lovely. So for my Mama. Good morning, everybody. Um, I literally just got off a plane this morning from Auckland where I was doing some work yesterday and I unexpectedly had a couple of hours free in the afternoon so I gave Dad and Raina a surprise and I popped in to see them. He, so we talked about today and that I was going to represent him and um, he was very touched. He sends his deepest thanks and uh, aloha to Creative New Zealand uh, and to everybody. Um, I think in terms of his governance work that he did over the many years, the creative art stuff would be, had, would be the most significant and the most important and the most that he enjoyed. So um, just so that I'm not repeating myself for the rest of the day, how is your dad? He turns 83 in two weeks time. Woo. And <laughs> thankfully he still has, all has his faculties. He's in quite good health. He stays pretty much 
um, in his house in Ponceville. He doesn't really leave the house much, especially under COVID. Um, but he's in good spirits, but he definitely is starting to show his age in the last few months. So just FYI, I just thought I'd give you an update. Otherwise, I'd be repeating myself all morning. But he sends his aloha and his deep um, gratitude. Uh, thank you, Mele. And of course, you met Karen Rangi is now the chair. We've got Ane Tonga, who was here earlier, taking on the mantle in that governance space. Um, I personally also want to thank uh, my chief, Chief Executive Stephen Wainwright, he's been right there beside me, put up with me, hasn't fired me. Um, so, you know, thanks, Chief. Not yet, anyway. Uh, so we're just going to give a gift now. This is a beautiful thank you from, uh, from Creative New Zealand. On behalf of our community, we just want to thank. This is on, from all of us. These beautiful lays are made by our Kukale mamas. These fafa too were made by Lucky Loko Kekea, Mama, who is our heritage artist. Um, thank you, Fetu. And this beautiful Pe'e Maoli book, we've got to get you the one too. And the beautiful Pe'e Maoli book that was done by uh, Papa John, I want to thank Jacinda Stowers and Tuaratini and the Mamas, Pacifica Art Centre. Woo. So they've also joined Kaikatea Funding. Thank you, Jacinda. We can't do anything without them. So thank you. But, thank you. We are now going to, um, thank you. I just want to say, Ua fa a fetai, ua fa fetai. Ua mali e mata e vaai Ua ta si lava oe Ua ta si lava oe I lo unei fa a moe moe Hip hip! Hip hip! Hip hip! Thank you! Morning tea! Morning tea! Oh, 
still see you, right? Yeah. Come on, stay in. Stay in the canal. Stay in. Turn in, turn in. So you bring your chair here. We won't face him, we face each other. Yeah.
No, no, we've got water. We can get a fruit. But it said, uh, like I saw a plate of fruits. Uh, can, we, can we have a plate of fruits? Please? Thank you.
Kia ora, everybody. If I can ask you all to take your seats for the next uh, part of our summit, thank you. Uh, hopefully, everybody is watered and fed, and I want to give a shout out to our staff at Te Papa who are, are looking after our physical needs and also um, please give a hand for the band thank you very much band um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, the small subgroup of our council meeting who are responsible for putting the next version of the strategy together from our discussions from today um, you already met, actually if I could ask everyone just to pop up on the stage behind me so I can point, um, that would be good. Um, from the Arts Council, we, you already met earlier on Fetu Fala and John Ong, uh, three of us alongside uh, my colleague uh, Robin Hunt, who I'm going to get to introduce herself. Perfect timing right now. Robin? Ali, can you bring Robin over this way, that would be great. Oh, you've got, you've got a mic already. Okay. <laughs> Turn up the front. Well, I can't see anybody for the lights, but... <laughs> Kia ora. Um, Taloha Marelele. Uh, Buna Banaka. I'm sorry, that's all the ones I can do, but I'll learn. <laughs> My name is Robin Hunt. I've been on the Arts Council, I came on just before the first lockdown, so that's a bit of a milestone for me. And I'm a Wellingtonian, although I live in the, although I come from the South, and um, when I'm not doing Arts Council work, I'm a writer, arts access agitator. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Robin, and um, she puts that agitating experience to use at our council meeting, which is really great. Um, so just alongside myself and Robin, as I said, are Fetu and John, who you've met earlier on. Uh, that's from the Arts Council. Um, and then I want to invite up the rest of the CNZ Pacifica team. I know you know many of them, but it's good to put names to faces. And I'm going to get each of you to introduce yourselves. So starting, Ali, with you and everybody else follow promptly. My name is Ali Fua'i. I am uh, Nguyen, American Samoan, Tukalawan, and Tuvaluan, uh, proud. I am an artist. I <laughs> I'm an actor and a writer, and I work for Creative New Zealand now. I've been in the job for five months. I am the principal advisor for Pacific Arts, um, working in my creatives team that works over the whole of uh, Creative New Zealand organization. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, Meitaki Mata, and it's wonderful to see all our community here. Um, thank you. Um, and just before the rest of the staff, you know, one of the things about having a, a big family is sometimes you forget the youngest child. So can I ask our last colleague, Ani Tonga, I know that you've already met, met her, so I'm just pointing out, also a member of our, um, our working group. Thank you, Ani. Sorry, I forgot you. Uh, okay, next. Maro e love again. Um, aloha kako, my name is Ani Tonga. Uh, I'm one of the more recent appointees onto this board I joined last year. I come from the villages of Vaini, uh, Gorofa'o, and Vava'u in the beautiful kingdom of Tonga. Thank you, tea gang up. Um, but yeah, very excited for us to get into Dao Noa soon. Aloha lava, I'm Irili Ipupo, I'm Samoan Tokilao. 
um, born and raised in Christchurch. I'm actually the um, Pacifica, uh, the Mana Pacifica na Navigator. It was bestowed upon me. Thank you, Tavika Navi and Makarita. But it's just really funny because, you know, people who know me go, oh, she goes one way, but everyone's going the other way. <laughs> so, um, good luck, Creative New Zealand. Kapitai Jelly Lava, Manuia, have a really good good time here. You know, this is for all of our artists. We need our voices to be heard. So it's amazing that you're all here. Thank you. Um, aloha nui ya kakoa pau, uh, o Kavika Kaiulani, o o Kavika, no kapa ena o Hawaii mea. Um, my role, Manager Pacific Arts, the first inaugural Manager Pacific Arts of Creative New Zealand. Um, um, yeah, definitely, just while I have it, just thank you all for coming, um, and thank you to our Arts Council and everybody for showing up. And um, I just wanted to say that I am a product of the Pacific Arts strategy, manifested in a role at CNZ. So, thank you. Um, I'm honored to be here, and of course, I, I love seeing you all, and it was so such a pleasure for me to see you all coming up the stairs today and giving you all hugs, um, and I hope more hugs to come, but less COVID, okay? If you're not feeling well, please stay home. <laughs> but, um, but other than that, aloha, and um, I'll, we'll have chats later. Kia ora koutou, ko Margo Wong, toko ingoa. Um, I am the funding advisor at Creative New Zealand. I take care of music and dance, and I'm basically Margarita's grasshopper. <laughs> <laughs> if you're seeing a black bur blur running around here today, that'll be me. Anyway, it's such a pleasure to be here. So good to see everybody. Kia ora Oh, man, Hello, my back. Ko Evateros Ariti Toku Ingoa. Um, I am a proud fruit salad um, from the Cook Islands, Rarotamoa and Achu, uh, also Samoa, Ireland, New Zealand, and India and China as well. Yeah. So, yeah. globalization right here. Um, I am a proud member of the Capability Services and Initiatives team, and it's just an absolute honor to be here with you all and be together after two years. So, mei taki maata. Oh, I'm going to stand in the middle too. Uh, it's Alo for Love, everyone. Um, Alo Love, this week for Malangi Mama. Uh, um, I also go by Paul. Uh, so, welcome. I am the Arts Practice Director, Pacific Focus. Um, I took over um, the mantle from the amazing Makarita. Uh, I too am a product of the Pacific Arts Strategy Woo! as well. Uh, in my first role when I joined the organization about three years ago as um, the first. Senior Comms Advisor of Pacific Focus. So, um, really great to be here. Malo Lava Bakhtai. Nisa Mbula Vinaka, Nayarangu or Jasmine Chung. Um, I'm the Comms Manager here at Creative New Zealand. Um, my ancestors hail from, I'm a fruit salad as well. There's a lot of fruit salads in Alfano. <laughs> but my ancestors hail from the Lower Netherlands in Fiji, um, Kambara and Namukai Lao, and um, also Hong Kong. Uh, England, Scotland, all the things, don't hate us, but I'm a very proud to be part of our Pacifica Queens here, and it's such a privilege and pleasure to be here to serve you guys. Thank you. Mano Loveless Wifua, Ono Wingo, or Esther. My name is Esther, and I'm the Senior Comms Advisor Pacific, so I took over Paul's position. I'm in Jasmine's team. Um, I'm Samoan, and it's an honour to be here, so kia ora malo. Uh, kia ora nata to ka toto e kukia rani o kia ora na mama ze papa. Um, I'm Catherine George. I'm a daughter of Rarotonga and Achu, and I'm senior advisor in our international team. Um, and really, my role is to be a connector for you. If you are wanting to go overseas, um, we help connect you to different markets, different networks, and different uh, international collaborators. So uh, wonderful to see you all today. Mei taki maata. My name is Sela Faletolu Fasi. I'm from Fasi Ota in Samoa and Fasi Moyafi in Dongatapu, Malole. Um, I'm the Arts Practice Director for Community and uh, Youth in Paul's team. And um, I'm really here to amplify, to listen, to serve um, our people. So, so good to be here. Love you guys. Have a good summit. Hello, 
Kathy or Catherine Laban. Uh, my mum's Fafu, the other side of Tulu. My dad is um, Du Matahu, but Laban. I also have another dad, um, um, Tulu Pailu, Tautulu. I'm the funding advisor Pacific. Um, I also work a lot with Paul Lisi, and I also look after the under general arts is multidisciplinary, so it's the festivals and that, and I work with um, Amanda as well. Thank you very much for coming. It's really important that you're here and that we hear what you're wanting from us so that we can better serve you. Tainama. Um, one of the, the pieces of feedback we got from the 2018 summit is, is that people said to us, we didn't know who worked at Creative New Zealand. We never met people, so we didn't want to make that mistake again this time. Um, it's my pleasure now to bring back Kavika and Evertia Rose, and they are going to do a report back on the progress that's been made on the 2018 uh, strategy. So, Kavika and Tia. Noia, Māori, Nisa Bulivanaka, Fakalofa Lahiatsu, Salofa, Malo Elelei, Malo Ni, Salofa Lava, Kiorana, Tena Koto Katoa, and warm Pacific greetings to you all. It is an absolute privilege for Kavika and I to stand here on behalf of our Toy Aotearoa Creative New Zealand's Arts Council and family and share with you all our Pacific Arts community some of the progress that has been made over the past five years. Firstly, and most importantly, we acknowledge those that have come before us. We stand on the shoulders of giants, our tupuna, parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, our villagers that support us, the activists, those who laid the path for us all and for Pacific Arts to be where it is today. The many villagers that have come together to help enable all that has been delivered over the past five years. We acknowledge the incredibly challenging and uncertain environment that has played out over the past two years due to COVID. And most importantly, today, we acknowledge you, each Pacific artist and arts practitioner, those both here and virtually, and those who aren't here, who individually and collectively make Pacific arts. We encourage you to think of this presentation as a bit of a highlights reel, kāre e filter, um, of what we have produced and uh, completed over the past five years. Okay. Yeah. We're also still learning how to click the button, so please. Thank yeah, I said kāre e filter. Right? So there's been the, there's been the. Here we go. Oh, is it? Okay. Three. Three. Let's try that. Oh. Here we go. Come on now. So we start with our po. The four po of our Pacific Arts strategy remain the same. Mm. Tangata, ensuring Pacifica artists and arts practitioners are resourced to develop their practice and deliver outstanding work. Vaka, Pacific Arts groups, collectives and organisations are supported to help lead and grow Pacific Arts in Aotearoa. Va, an innovative and networked Pacific Arts environment exists so that Pacific Arts are strengthened for future success. And Moana, meaningful connections across Aotearoa, Oceania, and globally to ensure that Pacific Arts are further enriched. A little bit of musical chairs, but to kick it all off, we're gonna start with the money. So <laughs> really quickly, this is a slide of the budget. What I want you guys to focus on is the green bits. The green bits, you can see that it's getting bigger over time. In short, I just wanted to let you guys know, if you haven't already and read one of Creative New Zealand's most famous books, The Annual Report, which is quite a thick, heavy book, um, there's a steady increase of funding for Pacific Arts during the period of the strategy. So what that really means is because of the strategy, we were able to materialize the thoughts, dreams, hopes, inspiration, put some dollar amounts next to those things and grow that inspiration and vision over time. And that is a thanks to every single one of you sitting in this room, as well as those that have put lots of mana, 
lots of effort into the conversations, sometimes very hard conversations, on the table previously, as you saw in our Matua panel. So thank you, Matua. Um, I hope this brings joy. I hope this makes you proud to see the growing of finances happening specifically for Pacific Arts. Next, I just wanted to look at the example for the 1.5 million in the Pacific Arts Fund 2017-2018, um, and that financial year has increased to over 9 million four years later. So Marilyn, what was that fund figure earlier when we had one Pacifica person, Anton Carter, working? Was it 100 and? 130,000. 130,000, and that was not very long ago. So I don't know if that gravity has set in you yet, but 130,000 versus what we're looking at today is a massive improvement for Pacific Arts. So hold on to that while we continue throughout this beautiful presentation. So what have we done? The Pacifica Festivals Initiative, oh, here we go. The Pacifica Festivals Initiative is an ongoing collaboration between Manutu Taonga, Ministry for Culture and Heritage, Creative New Zealand Te Aotearoa, and the Ministry for Pacific Peoples. The vision for the initiative is to support a sustainable Pacifica Festival ecosystem and to help these festivals to recover from the immediate and ongoing impacts of COVID. This initiative was announced in 2020 as part of the government's arts and culture COVID recovery program. The initiative provided $12 million over three years through a phased four waves funding approach. Two key points of difference about this initiative that are really important to highlight were co-design, designing each of these funding waves with the festivals and responding to their feedback on what their needs were at each stage of the initiative. And Kopapa Pacifica, Kopapa Pacifica being used throughout the initiative, honoring and utilizing uniquely Pacific ways of being and engaging, such as Talanoa, Fono via Zoom or Zono, Teo Leva, a shared understanding of collective community values and creating values-driven processes based on principles of alofa, manakitanga, tsautua, and fa'a'alo'alo. We are blessed to have some of the festival leaders here with us today, Seuli Teri Leo Mau, Media George and Hone Koka, Pip Lofiso, and Nicole Vaka, who will be speaking later on. The Creative New Zealand Arts Pacifica Awards celebrate and recognise excellence in Pacific arts across a wide range <laughs> across a wide range of arts practices and career stages. Any New Zealander can nominate an artist or themselves for an award. The awards have been offered each year for the past 26 years and are the only national awards for Pacifica artists across all art forms. Pictured here as you recognize beautifully, are our incredible, beautiful eight winners for this year. Jehu! We will be celebrating them on Thursday night. Over the past five years, we have increased award monies from 52,000 to 80,000 and added in a Pacifica Tora Award as of 2019, recognizing the contribution of Pacifica artists with the lived experience of disability to the standing and standard of Pacific Arts nationally or globally. We also had the first Pacific representative at the Venice Biennale, Ms. Yuki Kihara. Now, unfortunately, Yuki couldn't be with us today, but she is having a Talanoa of her own with the Pacific Gathering in Venice, so what a coincidence, I guess. But um, we're so very proud of Yuki and the ferocity she brings to just the art sector itself. As a pure artist, she has quite a vision. Sometimes that vision may get a little interesting, but we are so proud of her and the work that she's done. And as a proud queer person, I am so proud to see Yuki standing there in the spotlight. Um, and well-deserved, I believe. I think she's a fantastic artist. Um, yeah, and I don't want to spend too much time because I hope you guys are all going to watch her talk on Zoom later on. Um, we'll just move on quickly to the Pacific Arts Legacy Project. This was born out of um, COVID. This was one of those quick thinking things that Creative New Zealand did to say, hey, we are in a situation. How can the strategy work for our artists and our community? Um, and it is working and still continues to work. Albert Wendt, who couldn't be here today, but it was lovely to see Mele. Um, he was the first story that came out for the Pacific Arts Legacy Project. There's a 
cacophony of people that are a part of this. Um, and we just wanted, I wanted to give a special shout out to Lana Lopez, who's no longer here in Aotearoa. She's in America with other mahi, but she has been a fantastic editor in chief for the book. The book coming out next year, we will update you. Um, and thank you to all the artists and thank you to all the photographers I mentioned there, Raymond Sangapolutele, Edith Amatuanae, Patti Salomono Tyrone, and all the artists that participated. Also shout out to Langi Mama for their fantastic work with specifically working with our heritage artists to tell their stories. Um, it, it's, been an, and it's, it's been an incredible opportunity for me who doesn't come from Aotearoa to learn about these beautiful histories and these beautiful art um, legacies that will continue to bring, bring Pacifica forward into the future. Ah, another thing that we did, we've got a lot of these. Creative New Zealand Digital Storytellers uh, Photojournalism Masterclass. Um, as you can see here, these beautiful people are photojournalists, storytellers, they are also photographers, um, and this was created uh, with a partnership between the Seven Academy or the Seven Foundation based in America. The person who teaches uh, was the White House photographer. He was also a fashion photographer, and he also does, uh, I, I wanna say war zone, um, but um, he does photography in uh, very interesting places, currently with the hurricane that's happening in Florida. That is their tutor, so we get the best of the best, from across the world to work directly with our Pacific artists. Um, there, are, there are a few um, artists here that I saw from the current cohort. So we just started this program again, um, but this time partnering with MFAT. So we have Pacific artists based out in the Pacific Islands, five there and five in Aotearoa. More info to come, um, and we will share those stories um, in the next, uh, next few weeks. Beautiful. So this picture is from Kapanui 2022. Did anybody go to Kapanui or perhaps compete? <laughs> yes. Kia orana again. Um, so this is a festival hosted by Te Mai Vanui or Aotearoa. They received funding through the Pacifica Festivals Initiative um, for this year and 2023. Festivals like Kapanui and those funded through the Pacifica Festivals Initiative are incredibly important platforms and opportunities for Pacifica children, youth and adults to retain, maintain, engage with and celebrate their cultures, traditions and languages. This is becoming increasingly important with the young and growing population of Aotearoa-based Aotea Tangata Pacifica as identified by the 2020 Ministry for Pacific Peoples, Pacifica Peoples and Aotearoa Report. The button. Ooh, moving on, we've got Pacific Creative Entrepreneurs, the Pacific Art Strategy, saw um, a, a growing need within our leadership, with growing, in, growing need within our community to say, hey, we need better funding for long-term sustainable careers. This is how, one way of how the Pacific Art Strategy responded to that. So um, in this photo, you can see um, Jess Coco Solid with her partner Toki, Emma, um, and the Vein, uh, Vein Collective underneath. We had given them some putia to continue their projects, um, and we're looking at long-term sustainable solutions for Pacifica-led Pacific creative entrepreneurs. Really quickly, we are so proud of them. Um, it, it's been a big growing conversation around the sustainability thing. How am I gonna be a sustainable artist for more than just 30 seconds or more than just one arts grant? We are working on it. There is a lot of work happening behind the scenes. I know a lot of you are very interested. I've seen your emails. Please come and chat to me before that, or go and talk to one of these people. I think I saw Petone Groom here, and I think I saw Emma is still here. But if you want to, please go and have a conversation. These are your fano. Please go and talk to them about what that looks like. Green. Another thing we're doing, so Pacific Art Strategy is working with our international team within CNZ, and we partnered with the Australia Council for the Arts. This was a specifically digital practice focus, um, and it's called the Digital Fellowship. Last year, uh, last year we ran this. We had 110 applicants between Aotearoa and uh, Australia, um, and there were only 10 positions. So what did we do? Shovel a little bit more putia from the strategy so that we can get another Pacific person this opportunity. So we grew that, um, and we're constantly flexible within the strategy space. This year, this is, oh, I believe it's closing tonight. So if you didn't register, I hope some of you did, but it's closing tonight. Please, please, please hit submit. Um, as you hear from CNZ all the time, submit, submit, submit. Um, but we're very proud of this project. It was a really fantastic way. Um, as you can see, Rosanna Raymond is on it. And um, 
I personally like uh, the Wolverine guy because I think he's cool. But um, it was really a fantastic event to specifically look at what are the digital challenges facing our artists in a COVID environment. And these people have the answer. So they connected internationally. They connected over multiple uh, time zones and got their work done, and now they thrive in this whole network of creatives that exist specifically on digital. Not saying that has to be a practice, but these people have the answers to that. If you're interested in that, please go and talk to them. And I'm gonna push, play. Savvy is still here, Savvy. <laughs> I'm very proud. I worked at Pataka for a few years, and um, in Porirua, really briefly, I would always ask, where is the safe queer place for the second most largest Pacific population in Aotearoa? And at the moment, there, there was none. Pacifica had a spot in the LGBTQ community, and this is the first Pacific Arts residency specifically for LGBTQIA+. And I know Felicia is here, and she also coined the term MVP FAFF+. So we have specific Pacific leadership coming from um, our community, and we were so happy about this, um, and we are gonna run it again. So I know Anna Shasha's here, and I need to have a chat with her. <laughs> beautiful. In July, this one's beautiful, we shared that we partnered with New Zealand Symphony Orchestra to deliver our inaugural Pacifica Conductors Masterclass. Identified through Sistema Aotearoa, three talented young Pacifica women Hugely courageous, conducted, mu uh, sorry, conducted musicians from the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra with guidance from internationally renowned conductors. The two-day masterclass was a new initiative to provide foundational entry point to professional creatives for Pacifica conductors. And it was co-designed co between the New Zealand Symph Symphony Orchestra engagement team and our Pacific Arts team. Oh, mouthful that one, huh? Beautiful. Our knowledge holder of Pacific Heritage Arts may include individual community recognised elders, tufunga, pulotsu, taunga, master craftspeople and cultural leaders. Pictured here is Dr John Jonathan of, Ai of Awaiki Nui Manawanui and is a taunga tumukorero tutara. He is a much revered professor who holds degrees in government, history, business and Pacific studies a PhD in political science from the U University of Hawaii, and has ancestral roots in Rarotonga, Aitutaki, Avarau, Tongareva, Manahiki, Mauke, Mangaia, Aotearoa, Norway, England, <laughs> Germany, USA, uh. Samoa, and Tahiti. And he is a well-known composer of traditional Cook Island songs and has captured these in a number of books. Investment to the Pacifica Mamas supported the publishing of Dr. Jonathan's recent book, capturing further pe'e Māori, traditional Cook Islands chants. All right, um, one of the last ones we have is the Play Market New Zealand Pacifica Script Advisor Residency. Um, and so we have uh, run this twice. So the current one we have is, I can't tell. Oh, I'm sorry, Sarai. Suli Mo was 2021 and Sarai is our current, um, current recipient. I'll pass on to the the Boosted Ex Moana campaign has been mentioned earlier today, thank you, Carmel. Um, but the Boosted Ex Moana campaign is really looking at how you can grow your arts funding streams by getting other people to pay for it instead of just CNZ, to be honest. But um, the Boosted Ex Moana project was really fantastic because it gives a really great platform for emerging artists or emerging thinking ideas to come as a collective to create a platform where it's a specific cohort of Pacifica people, and the funding has always been successful. This is our third year of running this program, and I'd like to thank Jessica Palalangi from the Arts Foundation again for doing that. Hi, Jess. Um, and in two weeks, uh, next week Thursday, is the third open, so please take out your pocketbooks because there will be 20 artists looking for your putia. All right, uh, we've got strategic investments. Um, Tau Ili Ili, Alpha Mayaba, has been a really fantastic champion with the um, music scene. Hi, Tau Ili Ili. Um, thank you for coming today. Uh, Faith Wilson has been a big part of our campaign at Penguin Random House. And of course, I believe I saw Therese uh, Teresa here from the Govett Brewster, um, and we partnered with strategically these specific places because we saw gaps and opportunities that the Pacific Art Strategy could um, work with and work with these organizations that wanted to grow their Pacific 
uh, Pacific capacity. So we're really thankful for you three um, and the many others that we've continued to uh, work with throughout the strategy, and we look forward to growing all the opportunities throughout the future. I'm going to just rush out. Yeah, um, <laughs> another one that we have is Kasi Valu, um, who's been working. <laughs> Yeah, Kasi Valu was a big part of our Wikipedia campaign. Um, what we have done is that we had this beautiful idea um, brought to us from a friend of ours in the arts who wanted to use the seventh most largest platform or searchable platform um, and to start putting our Pacific artists on this platform. So now when you Google people like Lucy or when you Google people like Mary Ama, you will see that they have a Wikipedia page fully created by Pacifica people, edited by Pacifica people. Um, and now that our people are global in the digital age, you can just Google them. And we're trying to grow this community to be more online so that you're searchable and people can find you and offer you jobs and offer you money. Um, but also just to get to know you and that we can put these stories in a digital capacity, especially in times of COVID. In 2019, Pacifica-led organizations and our Tōtara and Kahikatea programs, Black Grace, Tōtai, Pacific Islands Dance Fono, The Conch and Tawata Productions saw a 68% increase of funding overall aligned with the Pacific Arts strategy. Next year, Kiamo Festival, Māori and Pacifica-led will also join, join the Kahikatea program. In March, we announced the Pacifica Arts Digital NFTs pilot program, which ran through April. This was a new initiative and was aimed at supporting artists to identify gaps in their digital knowledge, receive training to create content, learn about NFTs, and explore new ways to promote and celebrate Pacific artists of all genres through digital platforms. 10 Pacifica artists explored and evaluated the world of NFTs and developed their digital practice. They also shared what they learned along the way through Telenor and communicating to the arts communities and institutions about the project. Um, and one that's passionate for me is the Pacific Tour Disability Fellowship co-designed pilot by Pati Umanga and Keke. Um, Pelena Keke Brown, sorry, I just call it Keke for short, like we're cool. But, um, Thank you to these two champions who have been championing our advocacy and the voice of disability arts, not just disability arts, but for all artists. Um, they really have a creative vision and it's been really fantastic to work with them. Um, they've been a fantastic partner to the strategy, to CNZ, and we're continuing to work forward into the future so that we can continue to give voice to the people who need it the most. All right. All right. Yeah, um, we've also uh, partnered with the Fringe Festivals. I love Fringe Festivals. Um, it's a three years supporting the emerging Pacifica artists. Um, our Fringe Festivals from Dunedin, uh, Fringe Festival from Wellington and Fringe Festival from Auckland. Um, we've created a conversation between the three of how important it is that we have people creating, even on the fringes, but they continue to create, um, and whatever that looks like, we continue to support, and we found that as a strategic opportunity for Pacifica writers. So we're working with these three organizations that are paramount in our fringe community so that we can continue to push Pacifica people through um, channels such as this. And another fun one, the Pacific Music Awards Partnership. This year, we um, created the first Creative New Zealand Pacific Award. Yeah. So by their funky hair, you may recognize them, but um, we were very, very, very proud to offer this award um, to these amazing people supporting innovative genre-bending uh, genre music. Um, thank you, Petrina, for having us, and of course, thank you, Patti, and the community of the Pacific Music Awards. Um, Shepherd's Rain, sorry if I didn't mention that. Please go Spotify them. Um, Shepherd's Rain, they're quite fun. They, we sat next to them the whole time, and they were very like, who are you people looking at us the whole time? And then they realized that we were the people who were giving them the award. Fun times. <laughs> yeah. All right, and um, following up, the last one, we've got the CNZ MFAT Partnership. This was in the 21-22 financial year. Right. 22, um, signed in February 22. So what this looks like is that we as government had talked to another government organization to co-fund projects specifically building Pacific. So that is fantastic when you, it's like going to a potluck, you bring something, your friend brings something and you guys have a fantastic meal. But it was signed in February, Creative New Zealand, 
delivery by December um, 2022, which we have other projects coming up, which I'll talk about later. Um, we've got some reporting happening, and in the, uh, the person who's doing our reporting is Glenda Tuaine, who is based in Rarotonga. So Cook Islands, again, the world domination continues. Um, <laughs> The Digital Buona Nuia Kiva Resilience Initiative, we've got digital collaborations happening um, between uh, five artists, or artists based in Aotearoa, artists based across um, the ocean. Um, I will chat to you more about that in the future. And we also have Global Moana Storytellers, as I mentioned, with the photojournalism Kopapa and project. Um, and we have a digital festival happening. So please watch this space. Beautiful. So we've giving you like a massive amount of information and thank you for your patience as we've talked through that. This has been a highlight reel for the past five years, but this summit is about what you'd like to see for the next five years for Pacific Arts. What would you like the highlights reel to look like when we were reflecting in 2027 or 2028? If you will allow me to finish in my reel with a short pe and quote by Dr. John Jonathan, Maui te ko, maui te ere, ki a pukuro o ngā vaivai, Kia mokora o kaki, which means hold on to the spear, hold on to love, and anchor your legs like a breadfruit tree, and keep your neck flexible like a duck. What does this mean? Be prepared to be friends and be ready to defend yourself. Hold on to your principles, but be willing to listen to the views of others. We are so happy to be together as a community with you all in person after so long. We look forward to you sharing your views and to listening to each other honestly and respectfully. And while doing so, holding on to our values and having the best outcomes for Pacific Arts at the heart of our Talanoa during our time together. Noreira Kiorana e Kia Manuia. Nga mihi nui ki a tātou katoa, are you awake? Tā lo fa lava mā lo ilele ni sambula vinaka, fa ka alo fa lahi atu, halo ala ke te kem na Māori, moi o rān, ya o rāna, aloha, fa ka tā lo fa atu, noa ia. Kia o rāna tātou katoa, tō e te roa mā tō te atua, and just in case you didn't know, tangike, 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 wa mā tou ua o ki tātou. I greet you in all the beautiful Pacific ways because the reason we are in this room is of, uh, because of those places that we have come from and the way that it informs the creative work that we do. Uh, it was like watching, a little bit like watching the Academy Awards there for a little while. I thought, wow, look at this tandem pair. This is the new superstars. You know, 20 years ago, I used to be like, okay, 30 years ago, 30 years ago, I was a bit like that. I have the absolute pleasure of, hi, are you guys okay? They got no cheer. What happened? Red of New Zealand got no cheer. Oi, look at the mama, she might fall down. Put the chair on the table, oi. So, um, which means uh, just have some patience. We're going to put a few chairs there. I'm mindful that the ultimate producer is sitting in the front row and she's checking the time so that we make sure we can get you fed at 12.30. This is a mean task that I have to undertake. It's important, though, that I start off by telling you who on earth I am. Kia ora ana. My name is Tuaratini. Tuaratini is a name I adopted when I was 21 years old. You don't need to know about my birth certificate name, only the Bay Corp and IRD know that. <laughs> I am an artist, educator, facilitator and producer, but my wonderful job is project manager for the Pacifica Arts Centre, home of the Pacifica Mamas. <laughs> my job is something that I love to wake up every morning to, and that's not always the case for a lot of people who work in this world, so I am blessed. Uh, I am also the co-founder of a storytelling collective that tells stories around the world. 
before COVID, that meant we were on planes a lot at festivals around the world. And then during COVID, it was, what do they call them? Zono Zooms? But we tell stories across Southeast Asia, stories, Pacific stories, Cook Island stories that stack up very, very well indeed on the international stage. I've been brought in to uh, introduce you to some people who, like myself, are in the creative sector. Now, you would have thought that, of course, people just came to New Zealand from the Pacific over 60 years ago, settled themselves in the main centres and called this place their new paradise. But you know what happens when you're a Pacific person? You're a voyager, you're a navigator, you are seeking out opportunities in the deepest, darkest parts of Aotearoa. So we've brought some of those artists from the deepest, darkest parts of Aotearoa here onto the stage. Some of them are not from the deepest, darkest parts. I'm going to go through them. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. So they'll tell you their name. They'll tell you their heritage. Are you listening? Yeah. They'll tell you their heritage. Um, they're going to tell you what their art practice is, and many of them will have many art practices. And they're going to tell you what their latest project is. Okay? Or they might tell you what, their, what project they're most proud of in their career. Uh, so that will be the first pass. We'll go through and we'll see how we do for time. And then what I'd like to do is come back and ask them to comment on how their art practice has been nurtured and fed upon by the specific arts strategy. Um, as we heard from Kafika, I was born from the strategy. Um, lots of people born from the strategy. <laughs> so let's see how these artists have been impacted on or, or fed by the strategy. Everyone understand how we're going to do this? Okay, I have a list. I know you're not sitting in the order that my list is at, so, and I didn't put my glasses on because vanity is real. Okay, <laughs> it doesn't match my eikatsu. Uh, so I'm just going to read my screen, and when I call your name, you will stand up. Please also tell us where on the motu you are from. Okay, the akamata ne, which means we are starting. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Pip Lofiso. Talo for lover, Marlo Lele from the, my ancestral background of Tonga and Samoa. Uh, my name is Piplo Fiso, and I was born and still live in Utipoti, Te Wai Painamu. Um, yeah, Marlo. Yeah, I'll take this. Uh, people tell me I wear many hats. I wear one hat, and that is the service to our people. I have three main domains, education, creative practice, and my whānau and community. And so all of those things that come together is do whatever you can do to bring all of those things together. And your latest project? Uh, my latest project would have to be our Otsipoti Pacifica Arts Collective <laughs> here um, of arts practitioners, our arts navigators in our city who have come together to work together, collaborate and activate. Probably the latest project. And 29 years of Otago Polyfest. Next up on our list, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to introduce you to an artist, Teresa Tongi. Salo falava, ma loe lele. I'd like to acknowledge my family uh, from Vaie'e, Motaa, Alamangoto, and Vailima. I'm also Tongan by marriage to Henali Tekuriki Tongi, who is from Lemato of Avao in Tonga. Um, I am also a product of the Pacific strategy, and uh, my role is a uh, Pacific public coordinator at uh, the Gavette Brewster Gallery in New Plymouth, where I have been living for the past 10 years. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I have woven, my journey has been uh, one of community, of which I have worked in for the past 12 years in the disability, disability community and non-profit sector, um, caring for my boys who are disabled, and also working within the community um, through our Pacific Arts community and making all those work together so we can celebrate our Pacific artists. I do have a Pacific, uh, an art background, um, loved art at school, 
went to art school, taught art at school, and now that all has come in a beautiful full circle to doing what I'm doing, which is a dream job, working in a gallery and celebrating our Pacifica artists. Uh, if we can please have Savvy Nua. Hello, um, Lata. My name is Sevia Sevianua, also known as Sevi. Um, uh, my father hails from the villages of Solo Solo and Fangali. Um, my mother hails from the villages of Malie, Faliula, and Arasau. Um, I also have um, a Fangai background to my whanau up from the East Coast, um, all the way from the Marae of Iritikura. Um, I would think I'm a triple threat. Um, that's what my art practice. Um, I think I'm multidisciplinary, uh, but I do wear a couple of hats um, like many others do. Um, so I'm a teacher by trade, so primary trained, um, but also in education at the moment in tertiary. Um, also run a arts facilitated youth hub up at Waitangi Rua, at the heart of the Pacific. <laughs> um, I'm also part of the art strategy as one of the first recipients to receive the Aniva Award. Um, and it was great to be there to represent the MVP FAF community of Purirua City in itself. Um, and yeah. Thank you, Savvy. What's your most recent project, or maybe a project that you feel you, can, you, you would skite about? Um, so my recent project is the one that we just returned back from. <laughs> Um, we were in Auckland performing at Fede Festival. Um, yeah, so that was the most recent one, but also the project that was based around the strategy was my, um, my first ever curatorial um, exhibition, which was based on um, If the Shoe Fits. So, yeah, I think we'll talk more about that later. But uh, we're we're Thank you very much to you, Savvy. As I was walking up here, I, I actually said to the second row that I'm coming up here to run a Zumba, Zumba little uh, workshop for you guys. Whew, I'm just running out of breath just standing here, I'm telling you. Okay, moving to our next artist. Please put your hands together for Nicole Vaka. Uh, Maloli le, everyone. Uh, my name's Nicole Vaka. I am based in Blenheim, which is in the Marlborough region at the top of the south. Um, anyone here from Blenheim, Marlborough? I didn't think so. <laughs> um, and I think uh, that, that's a product of the Pacific art strategy in itself to have representation from um, one of the smallest regions in Aotearoa. Um, I'm actually Singaporean Portuguese is my heritage, um, but I think Teresa said it Tongan by marriage. Um, my husband is Tongan Māori, so... Um, Together we run a uh, Pacific performing arts business called Four Creatives. That's one of the hats I wear, mainly doing producing. Um, and I'm also the festival manager for the Marlborough Pacifica Festival, which we've just had our third year. Um, and we were really, really happy this year to have an in-person festival. Um, thank you. And so that's your latest project. Very well done. Thank you. <laughs> Moving along. Please put your hands together for Nina Oberg-Humphreys. Hi, hey, well, yeah. clap better than that. <laughs> uh, kia ora everybody, I'm Nina oberg uh, I am a visual artist that works with um, Cook Islands uh, spiritual items and what relevance they have to Cook Islanders living in the diaspora, or at least that's what I currently do. I also uh, run an, run an organisation called Tangatawana Trust and we do STEM education through Pacific Arts, Language and Culture. Um, probably the most exciting thing that I've been doing is um, we opened a gallery um, which is specifically for Moana artists in the South Island named Fibre. And um, another really exciting thing is actually just having a Pacific Hub for the first time in Ōtūtahi that we deliver, that has artist studios, uh, different organisations and um, a number of groups coming through that are Pacific. We've never had a space like this in Ōtūtahi, so that's the most um, exciting thing. Kia ora. Mei taki mata po karakara mai tātou. 
um, it is exciting to hear where in the motu these people come from. So we've, we've gone from down south, and I believe we're going up north, Nancy Kareroa, York. Kia ora na everyone. Um, thank you, 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 thank you. My name is Nancy Kareroa, recently York, <laughs> and I am a Cook Islander, born on the island of Mitiaro and raised on the island of Mangaia. Um, my uh, Pacifica heritage actually is predominantly Cook Islander, but um, in New Zealand, go all the way to England, and then on mum's side, we are also part African. So there's a whole mix there. Fruit salad um, in the making. <laughs> and um, I am here to represent Northland. I live in the Bay of Islands, but work in Northland, and I'm representing the um, organization called Fale Pacifica. Mm -hmm. And Fale Pacifica is the umbrella organization for our Pacific peoples in the Taitukero. Um, the recent project that I'm working with, I am a performing artist, although I didn't think like that before, until today. So I'm a dancer, choreographer, costume designer, and I never really thought about that as, because it's always been my, um, my other identity. My main identity has been a board on the trust of Fale Pacifica as the as the money lady, so making sure that the money that comes through from Creative New Zealand and other organisations lasts that bit longer for our people in any avenue up in the north. But also recently, um, on the other side of things, I'm a businesswoman as well, so assisting not only uh, mainstream businesses, but in recent times, Pacifica businesses up in the north to help them be smart about business, and a few of those business owners are creatives. So I am the money making, like the money woman, but also want to help our Pacifica people get their business up and running, get that money to last a bit longer. One of the most recent um, projects I'm working on as a performer is we will be performing on the 22nd of October at the Rugby World Cup in Whangarei. So my ladies have been preparing and making costumes and whatnot. And I am very happy to be here and meet you all and have my eyes open to opportunities, the Pacifica flavor. And um, yeah, just today has been a learning opportunity for me. Thank you. Me taking our mine. Seems to be a bit of a flavor on this list. Uh, we have now Mama Mi'i Hinarere Tupanga'aya. Reo Māori nōku, ko tōku i a upokotu, e peu nāku, ko tōku i a atamira. E pōu nōku, o te atueia tōku arataki. E parekura nōku, e arataki nōku ki te ipukarea. Kia ora ana tātou kātou toa, ko mii i nā rere i poe rawa tupanga i a tōku i ngoa, nō rarotonga mai au. E ano i au ki rarotonga nāra, e maanga fruit salad rati, me ngā putoru mai, ki manga i te rākatoa i wai i, e taiti. Ko tōku tūranga, i roto i te putuputuanga. I represent Awaikinui Mamas of Lower Hutt. As the president of the Hutt Valley Cook Islands community, and um, also, with the mamas, our theme, our encouragement for our young people to learn the cultures from a young age up to when they grow up and be mothers. And also we teach a lot of weaving, but mainly at the moment we are helping our young people all over. Five years ago, I was introduced to toy art festival here at Te Papa, where I named this festival as Out of My Glory Box, which is our Tiwaiwa, the Cook Islands Tiwaiwa, has been held in, a, in our glory boxes. Only comes out 
and birthdays, weddings as our traditional offerings to our people. And back in 18, we had another workshop and we presented a TV program which is called Stitch with Love. This is all our encouragements to our people, to our young people. Start stitching. Don't forget, follow your mother's footsteps. And this is why we mothers are encouraging our Cook Islands people, our Cook Islands young one, to learn and to know your stitch and it guides you to your generations of families. And your ancestors started way back. So we'll try not to forget it. We'll keep on teaching and we will keep on going. For our Cook Islands community, we are the needle and a thread that stitches together and binds us together. That's us, our Cook Island people. And, and to end, in Proverbs, chapter 31, verse 31, it's about the woman. What has her hands that shows and made and done and let the work brings her praise to the city gate? This is for us women. Don't stop. Keep going. Me Taki. If you've just joined us, this is an artist introduction. They'll introduce themselves, their heritage, where from the motu they are from, and their art practice, and they'll tell you a bit about their latest project. Up next is Sarai Perenise Rupeti. Salo <laughs> Falava, Oloingoa, or Sarai Perenise Rupeti. I am a writer-director based right here in Poneke, although I was born and raised in Porirua. <laughs> um, I was fortunate enough to be offered the Pacifica Script Advisor Residency with Play Market, um, and I'm in my last week of doing that. I'm also directing a development season of We Are Many by David F. Mamea at Circa. Kia ora. Next up, ladies and gentlemen, Kasi Valu. Malo lele, ko hoki ngoa ko Kasi Valu, o ko lele mai me la paha mo ma ufanga, funga faua. Yep, no. <laughs> uh, I always like to say that I'm a proud product of a migrant dream. Um, my family migrated from Tonga in the 70s during the economic boom, um, as a lot of our families did. What am I? Um, what do we do? What mm. don't we do? Yes. Uh, I'm a storyteller, a writer, an actor, currently my last year at Tukura Toifukario Aotearoa. I'm a proud dishwasher turned intern turned assistant producer of Le Moana. Yeah. Um, led by the amazing visionary that is Tupi Lua Lua. Um, and I also want to acknowledge all my mentors. Um, Tupi once told me everything is connected from the sky to the ocean, to the earth, to the very air we breathe, we are all connected. So today I carry that with me. Um, my latest project would be Pacifica United which Lemoana took up in Purirua, which was the, basically the polyfest for all the neighbouring schools, high schools in Purirua, and most recently, Mersina Festival, yeah, um, which was exciting. So uh, what I've learned uh, alongside the leadership and artistic vision of Tupe is uh, we take care of the emerging space for uh, our students who really come out of the tertiary um, institutes such as Victoria University, such as Toifakari, and giving them a platform uh, to share their work and giving them the resource that they require. Malo apito. Malo apito. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Nga Rupu, who's responsible for the wonderful Matua A that we gifted earlier on this morning. Nga. <laughs> Takumanunui, takmanurai, 
Takumanu erere ta iti iti ki tonga ki tokerau. Hoki mai, hoki mai, hoki mai. Ye koko. Kia ora na tato kato tua te aroa rānu ni o to tato a tōko Iesu Mesia. Ko ai au, who am I? Tōko i ngoa ko ngā rōpū. I hail from the beautiful island of Atiu. My mum comes from the beautiful island of Atiu, Mauke and Mitiaro. On my father's side, I am a Rorotongan and Tahitian. So, why am I here? What is my purpose here today? I think I have been voluntold or volun ask if I could come out here today and talk about um, my role with what I have done to beautify all your VIPs here today. So that is why I am here today. Also, I am a community multitasker in which, um, in which uh, we, I am based in Porirua. I am a qualified early childhood teacher. I am a senior teacher in my role. And I also am uh, involved in our little youth group, uh, which is called Wellington Atu Mapu, and, and where I support our mapu with the uh, culture, the real performances and all that, alongside with my dear sister Inaropu Tingaru and my brother George George. So that's all I have to say about me right now, but we'll go more into details later on. But seeing you all here this morning, afternoon, I am truly blessed. And I'll just say this uh, last bit. Mōmaya kanaka i te inoa o te tai kē, o ka tai mata e pipiri, o ka tai mata e kakana. Which, is, which means uh, you are living, sleeping in a land that doesn't belong to you, but you have to open one eye and close one eye. Which realistically means you have to be aware, you have to be alert at all times. Nō reira, kia ora nai, kia manuia. Me takira nui nui. You know, um, it looks like we won't have time for that last pass or that second pass where we go and talk about um, the impact of the Pacific art strategy on them. Uh, but quite a few of the artists have already mentioned. I can say that all of the artists that you see up here on stage have been involved in projects that have been supported by Creative New Zealand thanks to the Pacific Arts Strategy. And they are involved in collaborating and creating more opportunities for themselves going forward. If you'd like like to know about them. The beauty of this kind of event when you can't do it online is the opportunity to personally connect and make meaningful connections, lasting relationships and future collaborations. So if during lunch you want to put your plate down, stop eating, okay, so we don't get a diabetes. Come and say hello to these artists. We've introduced them to you. The door is open. Hope you've enjoyed meeting our artists. Uh, kia ora everybody. Just before we head to lunch, I just want to point out to the beautiful table at the back covered with te vai vais. Um, we are very fortunate to have a number of our mamas here from the community. If you would like to make yourself an A for our next couple of days, please go and see them. They will show you how to do it yourself um, and they have the materials down there. Um, again, before we go to lunch, which will be from now till 10 past 1, I'd like to ask our Papa Jose Atoka if he could please come and bless our food. Alright, now we have come to the very, very important part. So I'm just going to say our grace and then everyone's going to the table and vacuum all the food. Alright? 
All right. Let's say our grace. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the food and the drinks that we are about to receive. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
test, test, test. Whakalo uh, too. Hopefully you've enjoyed your lunch. Just if we could get everyone to start making your way back to your seats and we'll start in a couple of minutes uh, with our exciting panels. Thank you everybody. If you can make your way back to your seats. Okay, welcome back everybody. I uh, hope you enjoyed your, enjoyed your lunch. Never mind about Tuaratini telling you about your diabetes. Don't listen to her. Just eat and enjoy. <clears throat> so um, this afternoon's session is going to be in four parts. And we're going to take the opportunity to have four conversations about four strategic focus areas that at the last summit you said to us from your feedback that you were interested in exploring. And so for each of the conversations we've got a wonderful panel and an even more wonderful facilitator um, who's going to help run the conversations going forward. So it's my pleasure to ask to come to the stage uh, Quick Takes panel number one which is looking at Pacific Creative Entrepreneurs. And if I could please ask to come up to the stage, uh, the facilitator, the wonderful Fui Maono Kaupulo to Enderman. <coughs> Thank you. Um, and panelist members, Emma Tavula, Coco Solid, um, and the Vein Collective. We'd love to have you up here. Thank you very much. And I'm going to leave you in Carl's very capable and colorful hands. everybody. Very special greetings to all and wonderful people to be here. And uh, it's just great to be with all these wonderful uh, artists and creative people and also from the community. My job is to facilitate, and you know, I really get this up, get so enthralled and so hooked up in what's going on. Sometimes I just join in. But the whole thing is looking at entrepreneurs, the entrepreneurs. And these wonderful people here in front of me are all entrepreneurs and they're all creative and they're all artists. And, um, but you know, the term entrepreneur, like it really is, for some people it's quite a, a new term, you know, and it's uh, usually when people say, you're, you know, you're an art uh, entrepreneur, they usually talk about business, they usually talk about making money, but they, 
There's another side to this, of course, as we know, and during the COVID, that really brought it back in order to survive. And I know the three of you all have wonderful experiences. But for me, I just wanted to talk about, for you, each individual people, just to talk about your experience, both uh, as uh, artistic and creative entrepreneurs. But you know, one of the, the key things for entrepreneurs is also about being adaptable and also about taking risks. But the other thing I was quite interested in also is the fact that how you can manage stress. I just want to sideline this and talk about how wonderful to read. As a person, my background is in mental health, and I was really fascinated by the fact that in the art research, that 35% of the Pacific community actually saw art as contributing to their well-being. And of course, you guys have to be in front of that. And I just wondered whether to give you an, uh, the opportunity to first of all, just to talk about individually about your own uh, experience. And let's start from uh, Miss Fiji, Emma Tavola, of course, the Vunigo Rangi of all. And uh, Emma and I used to be on the Pacific uh, Arts Committee. So uh, how about you start first, uh, Emma Fatmanmoli? Um, my name is Emma Tavola. It's a real privilege to be here in this room um, from 2018, from our last summit. Um, this is a tremendous change to see CNZ's face looking browner and browner. Um, to see the results of the Pacific Art Strategy is, feels really good. Um, this is a sector I found myself in for 20-ish years. Um, I identify as a creative entrepreneur. Um, I run a gallery called Vuni Langi Vol in South Auckland, um, and I've been doing that since 2019, 2019. Um, I did that on the back of about 15 years in the industry, making exhibitions and producing events, and realizing that through creative New Zealand funding and through local government funding and through hustle, there was a way, I think, to create a model um, to survive in South Auckland, just. Um, and so I started my own venture, Vuni Langivo, in Fijian means um, a new horizon. Um, and all of the parts of my business center around the gallery. The gallery is a space I love to mediate the meeting of artists and audience where art can sort of be a form of devotion. Um, I love the gallery environment and so everything I do, consultancy work, advisory work, uh, writing, I sell lots of bits and pieces and um, it, all, it all supports the idea of a gallery. So. Um, you know, the first business plan I wrote for Vuni Langi Vol was basically thrown out the window because there is no data or um, evidence to suggest that an independent art gallery in South Auckland could survive or would survive. Um, so I think for a lot of us entrepreneurs and um, in this space, we're really um, on the edge of trying to convince people, trying to create new markets and everything that we're doing. And so... Um, it takes a lot of courage, and I'm really um, excited to see Creative New Zealand have a focus on entrepreneurship in um, this new era. So, um, yeah, an honour to be part of this ropu. Emma, you. Emma, you said a golden word. Just no, 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 not yet, not yet. Yours. You said the golden word, and that is hustle. You know, a lot of people don't talk about hustle. Yes, you are. You had to hustle. You know, if you were an entrepreneur, you've got to hustle along. And uh, could you like to comment about some of the hustling that you had to do? Yes. Every day I'm hustling, um, <laughs> said a great scholar, Rick Ross. Um, I think that um, when you start to realize that there are different ways that people will pay you <laughs> to do different things in our sector, um, it's really exciting to sort of work out <laughs> how you can keep, I don't know, d d generating, putting, putting art and putting experiences in front of people, putting projects in front of um, funders, um, and just keep 
this momentum going. I think hustle requires momentum. And you do, I mean, the entrepreneurs that I know um, are some of the most hardest working, never sleep, ride or die, <laughs> hardcore um, creatives driving change and driving revenue. Um, I, it's an amazing energy, but it's also exhausting. And we do need what I'm enjoying about, I guess, a post-pandemic environment is that we are having a conversation about well-being, about burnout, haora. So um, what's exciting and conversations I've shared with Coco is how do we actually do this um, work without killing ourselves? <laughs> and that's important. Well, well, you know, the, the point is, is Minister Sepuloni still in, in the room? Well, she's a very big hustler because uh, she mentioned, well, she had to hustle because, and she mentioned it in her speech. I mean, in order to get the money, you've got to hustle some of your fellow, uh, uh, and she dropped the name of uh, Grant Robertson, and also, rightly so, because he's the Minister of Finance. If, uh, uh, if uh, Minister Sepuloni wasn't doing her work, well, you know, the thing is, there's no money. That's, uh, that's a real a good example of a very good at high level hustler. You have, well, well, it is, but it is, <laughs> well, it is. Because I just thought it was a wonderful when she mentioned it. I thought, you know, that's exactly what entrepreneurs has to do, my lord. Okay, to our new uh, uh, panelist, really, and that's uh, uh, Petoni, and you come from the vain uh, creative uh, collective. That's an exciting new, uh, apart from a Ponzi name and a lovely name like Petoni, do you own Petoni, do you? Oh, no, no, named after my uncle. Uh, <laughs> yes. So, yeah, my name is Petoni, Malo Lavali Langi Mama. Yes, I am one member of the four, uh, which is called Vain Creative. A uh, little background about the name. It's one of the concepts for Creative NZ is VA, and then IN for innovation. Um, so then the, then the word Vain has its own play, eh? So it's kind of reminding ourselves, you know, got to be Vain out here. And a predominantly uh, industry that we are in is uh, white. So the name should always throw them off. So that was kind of like how we played with that. Um, a little bit about myself and my experience. Uh, so my name, as you know, if, if, if anyone's not from Wellington, there's a nice little area called Pizzone over there. Um, that is where my uncle, who was the first born out of Samoa, uh, was born. And so that name is now in our family. We are not Māori, but we are Sa proud Samoans. Um, but now that name is in there, and I have been blessed with that name. Um, so. You shouldn't forget it if you're from Wellington, so if you see me, you know, it's on there, so it's all good. Don't forget it. Uh, a little bit of background. I studied at Victoria. Uh, actually, all four of us met at university, but myself, I studied at Victoria University, studied a Bachelor's of Design Innovation, um, where I met a few of the other members from my group. One of them studied at Massey, studying graphic design, and then another one studied um, social innovation. So we have two industrial designer, one social innovation designer, and one graphic designer. So that makes up the four of us. We met at university, um, and then that we're finishing our degrees, and how this happened was lockdown was happening, um, and we were all looking at each other like, what are we gonna do? We have some cool ideas, we've done some cool projects at university um, that were aligned with our culture and our experience, but there were no jobs out there looking for that. And so they weren't looking for people that have cool ideas that blur the lines between design and art. And so uh, we came together to start our own one and make the job ourselves. So that was two years ago, uh, registered properly last year. So we charged GST, yay, fun times. But uh, <laughs> always difficult, you know? So ever since then, um, we've been just doing projects as projects come. And then, yeah, that's basically how we got to this stage now. So sorry, I don't know too much. Um, trying to make myself familiar with a lot of the faces, uh, but very new, uh, still up and coming, so come say hi. A little bit shy, overwhelmed, but cool. Petoni, Petoni, let's go back, go back. Uh, now, you're a young generation person. <laughs> and, you know, some of us are much older generation, like I'm um, your grandparents' generation. Now, your, your business, yep. your business, you see, you know, there's some young people here, they understand what your line of business, but for an older person like me, yep. And generally, one of the older people have is that we paid off our mortgage and things, so we're quite interested. We have the sort of spare cash. 
if I was coming to you and I'd ask you, could you just give it to me very simply? Well, actually, it's easier for me because you're Samoan, but <laughs> just give it to me very simply exactly what you will do for me. For you. Yes. What your business is going to be doing. Like, I know, I know what Emma is going to do, like, you know, uh, yep. as an art uh, entrepreneur, but for you. For because myself. it's a very new, yep. innovation, quite uh, exciting new, but it's very young. Yes. Uh, so, it really depends um, on the client. So, it really depends on what you're actually after, because we do have four creatives that have four different specialties. So, say you're a business and you're just starting up, which is the case and a lot of our projects is that they need a logo, um, some promotional material, graphic design, so they start up their business and we do that side because of things. So, but that's one thing, I guess another client might need a koha, me alofa, for a situation like this. And they're like, oh, we need some, something basfika inspired for me alofa, but not something you just buy, something customizable. And so then our industrial designer We'll work with that person um, in terms of that. So it's kind of like a, it really depends on the client, but we're very much on the design side of things. Okay. Does that kind of. Oh, no, definitely. No, definitely. Okay, we'll come back to cool. you. Uh, our third panelist is Darling Coco. She comes from uh, where I come from now, which is Christchurch in the South Island. I know people say everything finishes in the North Island, but Coco and I. Uh, are now in the South Island where, and I know that we've got the Dunedin ones here and also some crosses. Coco Saula, there's uh, our other engineer, but would you like just to share with us your uh, experience, Coco? Kia ora tātou, whakaaro pai ki ngā tangata katoa. Kia ora, Creative New Zealand and talofa lava everyone. My name is Jessica Hansel, aka Coco Solid. Um, I'm a writer, um, musician and artist, and recently um, the Kai Fakahide of a new artist-led indigenous space called Fiki Fortress in Unihunga in Auckland. Um, I direct that with my partner Tokoro Brown, who is Kuki Airani, uh, by way of Manahiki and Mangaia and Rarotonga. Uh, I'm Ngapuhi. Uh, my mother comes from Utakura in the Hokianga, and my father is German Samoan by way of uh, Lafanga, Fatuia, and Grey Lim. Um, we established Fiki Fortress very spontaneously. Um, we'd been looking for a space for a long time, for our community always had, you know, big projects and kaupapa coming up, and a lot of stuff happened in our lounge in our two-bedroom apartment, <laughs> and it was kind of getting really crazy, you know, so we were saying, oh, we need to create a space for people to actually uh, work in, and uh, a space in Onehunga became available uh, across the road from us, and it was a real opportunity in order for my partner and I to transmute some grief that we were experiencing, and it was a great way for us to um, I think offset a lot of gentrification that we were experiencing in the area. It was just like, we've got to take the block now as much as we can, as fast as we can. And the um, landlord was a Fijian Indian gentleman who kind of just said, I really want you guys to take it. You know, I really want this for you. And I was just like, I don't know how we're going to do this. And he said, I'll give you three months to find the money and if you can't, at the end of it, you know, that's okay, but I'm gonna give you three months to try and fundraise for this. So we did a crowdfunder, and we named the space Vicky Fortress after a creative world that Tukuro had um, made in an art exhibition, which was basically a alternative universe where Māori and Pacifica creatives can live without the perception and ricocheting off whiteness and Balangi interpretation. And so you're kind of, you know, unexplained and contained and sovereign in our ways and our workings and processes. And um, yeah, our crowdfunder um, was record breaking. We were able to get our rent sorted within one week. And um, since then, it's just been 
moving at breakneck speed, just getting it um, up and running. And now that it's, I think, in a good manaki position, we've, we're filling it with hui and, um, you know, small pop-up exhibitions. And transients is a big part of it. We want to have a fixed program, which is where we obviously hold prescribed uh, programs and ideas uh, of the galleries. We have projects kind of happening all the time, writing tables upstairs in a music studio as well as the main gallery. And then we have the fluid, spontaneous programming, which is people saying maybe a week out, hey, do you have Thursday free? I, we really need to have this thing. And that keeps it in conversation between what we think that the community needs and what the community actually needs. So they are curating themselves and prescribing what they need and we're happiest when it's a resource that we give away, that we give people the keys and say, tell me if you need anything, I'm across the road. But also, I'm part of the wallpaper too, so I can give that kaitiaki tanga if that's something somebody needs. Okay, look, I'm going to give change the scenario. I'm going to give you a scenario. Okay, a scenario. You're getting out of here, and on the left, you're just about to get in the left. And guess who's in the left? There's Karen Rangi, the chair. There is Stephen w uh, 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 Wainwright, the CEO. And to add to the absolute mix. In the same left is the Honourable Carmel Sepuloni. And, uh, and they all, now's your chance. And just to throw in a, just an added bonus, because Grant Robinson, this is his area, this is the electorate, he's in there. He's in there. Now, you have, when the lift goes down to the bottom of the papa, you have got to those time to impress those four people the following questions. I know it's three that you've got, that could go down, you've got to tell them why, why, who, what you're doing, and why should they fund you? And, you know, what's the best thing, and, just to throw in, because Grant Roberts will say, and the money, worth for the money. Do you understand that? <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> this is your chance. <laughs> Come on, let's give him a big hand. Come on, big hand. <laughs> so it's Karen Rangi, Stephen Wainwright, the Honorable Carmel Sepuloni, and the very bonus, the Minister of Finance, Grant Robertson. Go for it. Well, I would press the emergency button. <laughs> and then I would say, Talanoa doesn't have a time frame. Um, the left's going down, Emma. The left, the left. <laughs> um, I'd say when you fund people who hold space for other artists, you're funding a community. And so what I've always been so proud of is to hold space in South Auckland purposefully and consciously because when Wunilangi Vo Kaupapa are supported, artists who don't even come to events like this, who don't come to Hui to talk about funding, who come to the gallery, who have conversations with me about their practices, um, they benefit. And so I know when you fund producers, when you fund people who are sitting at the table, because we have the agency and the big mouths to um, get funding, um, you're funding a community. It's, it's not about an individual practice. I do have an individual practice as an artist, and I think it, both my, my management practice and my artist practice have to work together. They have to sustain, well, the, Management needs the artist more than the artist needs the management, but um, they they need to grow together. Um, but yeah, so yeah, fund me, please. Okay. Come out. Malo, Minaka, let's go to you, Apitoni. Yep. So in the lift, coming down, I guess I'd present them with, um, I'd say, look at this room. You'd see a lot of furniture, chairs, tables. Um, how many of them are by us? 
to fund us is to fund us, the vision of being able to work on stuff like that. So we are very much in the line of design, and if you look around, the chairs, the lights, the items, the products that are all mass produced, we are buying them from overseas. And our goal as Vane is to, although we are early in the graphic and the web designer stuff, is to be able to scale up to a, to a level where we can have a room like this full of um, our own products that we make ourselves. Maybe it's in the islands, maybe it's here, but that's the vision. That's how, well, I got here on this stage and that's the same thing I'd present to them in the lift. I guess, I guess I'd hit the emergency button too. Um, but yes, very much how I would picture it is look around, how many of these products are ours? That's what Vane is all about, is working, getting that back, getting some of our material culture back and through a digital way for the next generation, um, massive. So we learned that partially from our experience at university and so we want that, we want to be in the classrooms where hopefully students like ourselves will learn about us because we didn't get that as we came through. Right. So, Let's fund us! No. <laughs> you're doing well, you're doing well. No, person, you're doing well. You're doing well. Okay, to you, Coco. Okay, I would hit the emergency button and I would say, you know, welcome. You need to subscribe to Indigenous Island Time now. Time is not real, it is just you and I. And then I would say something like, do you believe in a revolution? <laughs> yes. <laughs> because I feel like all well, Māori Pacifica people, even if they are in an institutional role underneath all the rubble, they want a revolution as well. And so, you know, I would really just get to the nucleus of that. And then I would say, the thing with me is that I can be very kind of, I go the radically blunt way, because it's quick. And it's also, they can't accuse you of not telling them. So I would just say, give me the money and the people will be free. <laughs> just give me the money, the people will be free. Like, don't you want that? Don't you think that your two printer wanted that? And I doubt that they would get off the lift not feeling guilty if they disagreed, and you know, not feeling a little bit thrilled if they agreed to it, because it's a little bit of a Riddler moment, you know? Be like, <laughs> Okay. Now, our previous presenter, Kao, uh, they, they presented the strategy. Now, as interpreters, you know, you've got the waka, you've got the va, you've got the, all the, 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 the four areas. Where do you think you fit into those area? Because that's part of the, being the interpreter, isn't it? Do you fit into this particular va? Do you fit into the waka? Whereabouts do you fit in? Um, we can fit into any po you like. Um, but tangata in a big way, um, yeah. because we are about helping, seeing the voice and the potential of artists come to life. Um, so it's about understanding how to bring out the best, how to hold space for our communities. Tangata in a big way. Va in another way, because you have to be able to read that space. How do you work with different artists in different ways? How do you work with funders? Um, yeah, and then Moana, because some projects necessarily have to link us back. And um, yeah, I mean, I will put an application for everyone. <laughs> so, yeah, Absolutely. pretty much. Moana, Lulaka, Johnny? Yep, we're very much in the VAR. We are in our own space, but very much connected to both um, a lot of different, I guess, areas. I, an example of this would be we could go from a community project, helping our friends of a music video, to being on Monday in the Office of Internal Affairs, designing their strategy stuff. So that VAR that we belong to is, um, is very unique at the moment. Um, so yeah, very much in the VAR, uh, hence the name as well, Vang. I, I think that's a very good, uh, both points very well, because one of the things about an entrepreneur is risks. And one of your biggest thing is, uh, as a business, is your financial risk. So it would make you available for those, uh, just to align yourself with those uh, the strategies, isn't it? Very well point to you, uh, Koko. Uh, I think, because I'm Tangata Whenua and Tangata Moana, and uh, my partner is Kuki Arani, so they're able to oscillate between these ideologies really easily. And we have, um, 
tino ranga tiratanga at the base of what we do as well as you know we're always thinking of uh, the moana and the agenda of the south pacific um, we really shape shift to meet the brief and um, i think when you're working uh, with a spiritual intent uh, you're often kind of moved by different concepts at different times and you're asked to perform and conform to different ideas and i just think that we respectfully want to serve what it is the community that we're working with at that time needs from us or what we feel intuitively is needed um yeah in terms of kind of the financial uh, stuff i feel like it's the same it's the same kind of sense of possibility and risk and ambition that is really intrinsic to our people you know i've outrun so many nepotism babies over the years that it's kind of like just cracks me up because they it's so inherent to how we work you know it's like i'm wired for not struggle but i know how to accrue resource and mobilize a community and get Voltrons to assemble, you know, that's just one of, <laughs> one of my powers. And I, I have to make good on that ability because all gifts we have, we need to actually use as service. Okay, uh, because I, I, I really wanted to, to, to change this by having some questions, of, but I know that a lot of people will have questions about entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to ask, you know, like, as I said, I come from health. And, you know, the arts and creative uh, uh, community is one of the one area in New Zealand or in the world where Pacific people are actually in the positive. You know, in every other sector, education, health, or social, whatever, we're in the deficits. You know, so the investment in art and creative is significant. I mean, compared to what they give up money here, compared to what in health, and particularly mental health where I work, it's pittance. But you've got a lot of the uh, outcomes, it's superb. As a, you know, uh, entrepreneur, where do you see that in the future? Future, is it to grow that, or is it to maintain it, or what? Emma? <clears throat> That's a big question. Could you repeat it? <laughs> oh, you know, as an entrepreneur, like for the outcomes, and we know the results because we saw it. The outcome is significant, and the people who are participating in it, you know, like 35% of the people, to just repeat myself, said that during the COVID, the arts assisted them in their well being. Now, I know that the Ministry of Pacific People just released their well-being strategy, and that's got to have lots and lots of money in it. But I want to know the future. Where do you see the future of interpreter, artistic, creative, artistic? Is it going to remain in this area? Do you want to see it in other sectors? What is your vision of the future of artistic, creative, uh, Entrepreneurs. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I think what was really interesting about our first panel today, hearing from those um, Pacific Arts Committee chairs and thinking about the change that has happened in the decades since Albert went. And um, I think about what the art world was then and what the art world is today. When I saw the faces of Creative New Zealand stand up here today, I know the art world is a very different place to what, even what it was in 2018 when we last assembled. And so I think what has changed is visibility. Um, you know, I always I don't like to... When I was young, when I first started Fresh Gallery Otara, there was probably like in 2006, like one or two Pacific art exhibitions on the calendar in Auckland a year. And now it's, we're saturated. We literally, there's things on every weekend. It's a very different landscape now. One of the things that I think has come in to diversify and enrich in this art world is that um, we now think about things like social inclusion around diversity. We think about where arts and culture is experienced and absorbed outside of these traditional uh, Eurocentric ideas of where you do art and experience culture. And so I think 
The future is, um, and particularly after the pandemic and through the pandemic, what we've seen is how important creative uh, creativity um, plays into our well-being. And just as a sort of side note, I have a, my daughter is eight years old and she's just started to, um, <laughs> I've told this to a few people today, but um, she's just started to identify herself uh, as a Tongan, in Tongan Language Week, as a Fijian in Fijian Language Week. Um, and it's, it's that externalization of her identity that I think is a really powerful way to stop f people feeling isolated and alone in their own thoughts and that we are weirdos <laughs> and mixed, you know? Especially if you're growing up in communities where, you know, like I'm bringing up my daughter in South Auckland where I wasn't raised, so she, we don't have any family there. We don't have that social structure to enforce her identity. So I know that the arts helps us feel secure in who we are, um, and that's only good for how we move through the world. So I think a social bottom line is where things are moving to, um, thinking about well-being and how that plays into how we can operate as creative entrepreneurs, and inclus inclusion, visibility, the fact that we have Pacific Art Advisors, plural, at Creative New Zealand, the game has changed. The Pacific Art strategy has changed the game. So it's exciting. It's about visibility and inclusion and well-being. Uh, just before I go to this, it's because uh, it's something that Sefita Hauli said, and that's the language. Now, you mentioned the language. You see, one of the, the so we'll just listen to you, Emma, and also to Koko and to Petoni. You see, this is the area that entrepreneurs can actually go across because you can go across education. You can go across, isn't it, what I'm saying? Like, uh, and I think uh, Seth's uh, uh, point about you know, the language, because it's the artistic, creative people that really can linguistically do that. I said to her, for instance, don't, for medicine, for instance, don't talk to uh, doctors and nurses about, go to the traditional linguists, because that's where the roots of the foundation of you know, the languages come from, not in the, the Eurocentric, as your point is, but well made, uh, Emma. I'll just do a quick follow-up on the idea of Pacific languages. Sorry, just that I do have a little bit of criticism of the Pacific language structure, how, because what I think is problematic is when, and this is why I love the arts, is that you can be a Tongan, you can be a Fijian in fullness, in wholeness, without the language. Your experience is still valid and important, and that's what I think is exciting about the arts. We can enable people to see themselves in ways that, you know, we're, we're told we're not good enough, or we don't have this fluency, and all that kind of thing. So I think language is sometimes used a little bit too heavily, um, because, you know, we, we are still custodians, genetically, ancestrally. Good point, okay. I've been told that we've got four more, four yep. more minutes. So, so the future of the arts, or the future. the future. So for us, or for me, I guess for the boys, um, the future is going home, mate. Going to the roots, going to where we all started, our ancestors. Um, but obviously we have to work hard here first. But it would be a dream, and I'd say, I'm saying it now as the future is to uh, apply our mahi in Samoa and across the islands. Um, being able to, we've understand, we understand that we are very priv privileged right now to be receive the Western education that we did receive and a lot of other things like um, starting our own business and being able to speak at sp spaces like these. So it would be a dream to not only go back to Samoa and back to our islands, but also, um, you know, relearn the language and be in it. I think it's, it's, it's one thing to say to, for us to try, or for me to try to relearn my culture, but I think if I was placed in the, in the environment, um, I think that would come about Milo. in its own way. Yep. My Lord Petoni? Uh, I think the reason why we are represented well in the arts is because we are the source of so much. Um, there are major inequities of our people within the justice system and in other kind of um, quadrants of society, but in the arts, I feel like it's indisputable. Our talents are unavoidable, and um, we are really at the forefront of change in terms of our voice. And so with that in mind, and that un unapologetically in mind, 
I think that we need to each one to teach one, which is, means that you need to radically, aggressively mentor your rangatahi and your emerging um, artists, and there needs to be intergenerational conversations happening all the time, nodes of contact so that everybody is staying as informed as possible and as socially mobilised as possible. And I think you need to respect the luxury of physical spaces and kārohi ki te kānohi, where people are able to conversate off the grid, away from power regimes, so that they can begin to imagine a new paradigm and actually activate one. Mahalo. Thank you, uh, the, the panellists, because we're running out of time. Really, can I, let's put another uh, big hand for our Emma, for Petoni and for Koko Whaumori. Thank you very much, people. Thank you. So um, at this stage, I've been stuck in the lift for 20 minutes with the emergency button still on. I'm a little bit afraid by now. Um, because, and I'm hoping it's a really big lift if I'm thinking about all the people that are in there. Um, but a couple of things that I would say to, if we were to have those conversations in the lift, and this is one of the challenges I want to put out to you as artists, is that um, the question that Fuimuana asked is, you know, what would be your pitch to us as funders? What I'm more interested in is actually what is the relationship that you want to have as artists with Creative New Zealand. This is the kind of um, environment in which we should be thinking about how do we all do things better together. So I'm not for one minute assuming that we will always keep on doing things the way that we've done them. So that's the thing I'd like you to have a think about. How, how could it look different and better than the system that we've got now? So I'm really interested in hearing that. And, um, you know, if it, if it came to the point where I had to choose between the three of them, because, you know, we never have enough money to go around, and as much as it's terrible to pit our people against each other, you know, I would have to choose Jessica, because clearly she's got the judgment to be dating someone from Manihiki, and ser so she must deserve the money, right? It's, um, it's a pretty clear criteria, as far as I'm concerned. Not biased at all. Um, but um, again, give it up for our panel. They were fantastic. And so we're about to move on to our quick takes panel number two. And so if I can ask the team if you can get us organised for our next uh, lot of conversations. And the subject of, of this conversation is Pacific Tour Disability Arts. So we've already celebrated this morning the fact that one of the things that came out of the strategy was our recognition of that intersection between arts and our people with lived experience of disability. And we've been able to celebrate that already a couple of times, and we will again on this Thursday night. So um, it's important then to us that we hear from our people, our artists, who have lived experience of disability, and thinking about for the future, uh, what life could look like in our Pacific arts sector. So um, we are very, very fortunate to have on the panel Pati Umanga, Lucy Fayava, and Tusiata Avia. We're going to be facilitated by Tauilili Alpha Mayava. And just before we do that, I would like to um, invite my colleague back to the stage, Robin Hunt, just to introduce uh, the session. Thank you. Where's our Robin? Greetings again. That was a hard act to follow, I must say. But um, I'm very proud to be introducing this particular panel of people who are well known probably to you, but they're also well known much more widely in the community. So we've, always, we've already seen the work that Pati um, and Kiki Brown have done. Um, Lucy, it was lovely to meet Lucy Favour for the first time because I've admired her dance from afar. And um, 
Tusiata Avia is somebody whose work I have admired greatly for some time. So they are performers who are well known in the wider world of the arts and the wider world of disability and of course in their own Pacific world. So I'd like to welcome them to the stage. And, and also, and leave you all in the capable hands of Alpha, who will facilitate the session. Thank you. All my life I have been performing. Dance has been my way of communicating for so many years. My way of letting people know what I am thinking. But now I want to make a change. Make the audience see who I truly am. So we're going to use the words enter, return, control, delete. You had to make that your dance. Hello, Falava, Tenakoto. Greetings. My name is Lucy. I'm a Samoan Kiwi born performer with a disability, cerebral palsy, spastic quadriplegia since birth. It affects my muscle coordination on both sides of my body, especially my speech. Which one? Mm -hmm. Control. I communicate through a touch link, but mostly my eyes. Return, delete. But how I really express myself to the world is dance. Dance has been an integral art form for Lucy to communicate, to storytell, to perform and connect with her culture. And, you know, when I look back at all the works that she's made with Touch Compass, they have been around her culture, around her identity, and how she kind of connects uh, being a New Zealand-born Samoan artist. So I think it's huge. I have been performing for well over three decades now. I started with Touch Compass as a founding member and have done many pieces of work with them. Lucy is one of those people with a really proud track record in the arts of our nation. She was a founder of probably our most well-known mixed ability dance company, Touch Compass. And Lucy was good enough to play quite a big role in the development of our Pacific Arts strategy. And one of the key themes that, that came through there was, let's do something mindful about supporting practitioners who have a disability. I'm here. I'm here. Arriving into my own dream. My favorite piece was Lucy's Eden which we toured through New Zealand. There's a famous image of Lucy almost upside down because she's dancing from a trapeze. That photo is so powerful and it really symbolised the energy of, what could, of a world that could be through the power of her art. Performing arts break down barriers. It helps people to listen to our voices. We just need people to understand our frustrations. Lucy's way that she creates or performs, I think, you can see it in her eyes. She's a very emotive storyteller. And she's like very joyful, but also there's quite a lot of, um, she's easy to cry. I think someone's also cry all the time, so that's fine. Yeah, but I think she's, I think that's why she's a powerful storyteller, even if the movement is small or big, because she's so into the emotion of the movement. Hello, hello. Can you all hear me out there? Yeah. Very good. Well, look, before we push on, we just want to say uh, keia kurahi, keia kunui, uh, tēnā koutou katoa, uh, ko uria hau uh, no ngā ranga uh, kāua i rangatira hāmoa, ke ho ki o hau o niwe. Uh, ko tawili ili ta, uh, alfa mayaba toko ingoa, ma lō lava, ta lō fa lava. Uh, first and foremost, uh, that's like the second time I've said first and foremost, uh, 
I'd like to give you a disclaimer. My English is not that perfect. I don't respect it a lot because I was born with my own. So therefore, if I do stumble, aroha mai. Um, but before we get on with the rest of our panel today, can I just say a big round of applause to our Tangata Saili Malo, our disability community. This year was the launch and the recognition that uh, Tangata Faikaha or Tangata Saili Malo or Pacific or just disabled people all together required a ministry to be responsible for what they need, when they want it, however they want it. And so that is a big plus uh, already for our disabled communities. And just to give a little backstory before I shut up and I say something wrong in English. Um, Lastly, I'm part of Tofama Mao Collective. Tofama Mao Collective is, is the first and currently the only Pacific disabled collective in Aotearoa. Formed in 2018, we got together and continue advancing the call for the rights of Pacific disabled people in Aotearoa to have their own say. So last year, we launched a petition calling on the government, of the, government, the government of Aotearoa to recognize and to launch a disabled ministry. My son, if you saw me earlier, was the face of that petition. It is still online. And it got answered by the government in October 21st last year. Now, it's not our petition. We just continued a call that started by a lot of our Tangata Moana, that I passed away, Tangata Fenua, and a lot of the stalwarts of the disabled communities of Aotearoa that have long passed, and we are now here bearing its fruit. So a round of applause for everyone that came before us. <laughs> this is probably the panel that you're gonna learn the most from. The reason being is we are part of a community that is a kind of a thought, but it's not part of the normal conversation, not only in mainstream, but also in Tangata Moana. Now, you'll forgive me if I don't use the term Pacific, because we are on a journey to decolonize and bring our language back to us. Before the Portuguese man sailed past and saw our ocean and called it Pacific, meaning calm, we've always been sons and daughters of the Moana. So that is who we were, are, born, and who we will always be. So for Tangata Moana to be here today, let us get into it. We are in a space that we very rarely get given the opportunity to speak for ourselves, to tell the world about ourselves. We are usually talked off, spoken of. So to begin our segment today, I'd like to give the opportunity to our panelists to tell us about who they are, whatever part of their story they want to share, and also a little bit more about their creative process. And just to begin that, because she's right next to me and we're all wearing red, copying Fui Maono, who came on earlier on, please put your hands together to welcome Ya Tanga Tangaloasa Tusiata Avia Fambol Mod. Um, and my Lord is we for Mawa Malelangi and Mama uh, wishing you good health and blessings from the heavens. Um, I'm really honoured to be here today with this panel, um, Lucy and Patti. Um, I'll just tell you where I'm from, who I am. So I'm the daughter of Namalo Ulu Mikaio Avia, the late and he hails from Lefanga. There's a few Lefanga people here today, right? Um, Whongapoa and Iva Sava'i, which is where my Tula Fale title, Tangaloa Sa, is from. Thank you for doing your, um, your research. Um, and Catherine Sylvia Avia, um, whose parents hail from Yorkshire, Gloucestershire, and Foveran. Scotland, so I come from the colonised and the coloniser. Um, having those two warring parts inside me is great artistic material. Um, I'm mostly a writer and poet. I also dabble in other things. Um, I, I wrote a piece for today. Uh, I think I'll read that piece. Shall I read that piece? Yeah, so um, one of the questions that 
we were given to kind of answer was, you know, what am I doing right now? So I'm always working on a new book. Um, it's, I think it's called Big Fat Brown Bitch. So look out for that one when it hits the stores. Um, and there's a new play on its way, The Savage Colonizer Show, um, based on my previous book, um, spearheaded by the king and queen, or maybe I should say the queen and queen, um, Victor Roger, producer, and Annabella Politaival, um, director. Total dream team that did Wild Dogs Under My Skirt, and I'm, I'm really thrilled to death um, to, Victor wanted me to say something really rude and horrible. I'm not going to. I'm, I'm just not going to do it, Victor. Um, <laughs> I've, always, I've also been trying my hand at, um, he wanted me to talk about his bum. <laughs> no, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Um, he wanted me <laughs> stop it. Um, I've also been trying uh, my hand at um, some new disciplines like screenwriting. Um, I was part of the um, Pacifica Women's Screenwriting Program um, and that was really awesome. Um, so we'll see. We'll see how I go with that. So I'm going to read you this piece. I won't go over my time. I timed it very strictly. All right, I wrote this on Saturday. Um, I'm really a newcomer to this disability space, and this session for me is partly coming out as a person with a disability. It's ironic today that I came up here with crutches. Um, don't let that fool you. Um, this is not a permanent thing. My disability is an invisible one. I have epilepsy. Um, although I've had it since I was 27, it was controlled up until six years ago when, yeah, now it's just, you never know when it might hit me. So in the last six years, I've also had a number of traumatic brain injuries as a result of a lot of seizure falls. Now, every person's epilepsy and or traumatic brain injury is different, but for me, it shows up as short, medium, and long-term memory blanks, difficulty with word recall, which is bizarre since I'm a writer, um, exhaustion, nausea, and constant headache pain. Um, these things interfere with, but they don't stop me from being able to function as a working artist. I have a lot of seizures these days, sometimes every day. Sometimes I'll get a week or even two weeks break. My seizure pattern is always changing, so it makes it difficult for work schedules. It's mostly a case for me of fingers crossed uh, but sometimes if I have a seizure that I can't bounce back from quickly, I have to cancel work commitments at the last minute, which is a massive drag for everyone concerned. Now, for some reason, seizures hardly ever, or um, I, in fact, I don't think they ever um, happen on the stage. They, ha they very rarely happen in public. Um, Mostly they happen when I'm out of the public eye. And in my 21 years of performing, um, public speaking and being on stages like this, I'd never had a seizure on stage. Which is quite miraculous to me. And sometimes I wonder if there's an invisible ancestor specially devoted to keeping me from falling on the floor, frothing at the mouth, and peeing my pants on stage. Believe me, it has happened in other places like our very first rehearsal with the cast of Wild Dogs. 
Apparently they were all a bit nervous that I was there to watch them and I promptly fell over and peed my pants, like not just my pants, but the entire floor. Um, when I came to, these, this beautiful cast were all wearing these long black skirts and when I came to, they were all wiping up my pee with their, white, with their black skirts, which is weird and beautiful. Um, <laughs> Right? I mean, yeah. what's Right what's up there with a big this bum. Yeah, what's going to bond you more than wiping up someone's pee? Um, so I just want to share an experience that I had on Saturday. Um, I was with a group of artists who are also friends, and we were discussing a couple of performance projects and I couldn't remember the details of the upcoming project. I also couldn't remember if I'd performed in the previous project. And like Islanders do, they all laughed. Now usually, I laugh along with them, but this time, really took it to heart. I tried several times to explain about my disability around my memory blanks and how I truly didn't remember, but the laughing got louder and louder. I felt overwhelmed. I got up and I left the table. I found a bedroom and I had a very big cry. Now I think I really needed that cry. It's the first time I've ever cried about my memory blanks. In fact, it might be the first time I've ever cried about my disability. I've been angry, I've been resentful, I've been sorry for myself, but I've never cried. I cried and I realised that this is what I should talk about today. Now this is not a pity talk, this is not a victim talk, this is a consciousness raising talk, primarily for myself, and secondly, for anyone here who has to deal with an invisible disability in whatever form that might take for you or for someone that you're close to. This panel is called Tor. I don't know if you've noticed I have this special Tor earrings on, yay for me. And, and um, who is that? Uh, if you ask me later, I'll tell you who makes the earrings. I can't remember. Uh, you can laugh. I can't remember. Um, and we are indeed all the meanings of that word. We are strong. We are courageous. We are warriors. We have to be to keep creating. But for people like me, the other side of that warrior strength is vulnerability. I can't drive a steamroller over that, lay down concrete and pretend that my vulnerability doesn't exist. I wouldn't be honouring myself, my disability or my art if I did. I know myself as strong and in talking about my invisible disability in public like this, I'm also knowing myself is vulnerable, open, and honest. It's my hope that this part of my story with an invisible disability has been of some value to you. Are we gonna move around or are we gonna do like the whole 10 minutes each? Well, when you're done, let me know and then I'll throw the gondola and we'll keep down okay. to that. It's our own time. The clock is out the door. All right. <laughs> so maybe we'll come back. Uh, All right. Yeah, I'll finish the there. I'll yeah. finish there. I've got like. Round of applause for uh, <laughs> Tangalosa, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. You know, just before we move on to Fono T, uh, this year, the theme for the uh, celebration of the International Day for Disabilities, it's in recognition of the unseen disabilities. 
So um, we tau toko, we uh, langona lau fa so le nea fia pi fa tai te le lava. Uh, Lucy, we'll come back to you because blue is my favorite color. But in saying that, I'm saying that whatever for the is wearing is not. But also my other favorite color. Lava fionga for the tea, but you bang up, yes, I'm so long about yourself and your creative space and what you're doing with it at this very moment. Fa'amun mo le lava. Fa'amun mo and my name is Fonoti uh, Pati Um I'm not a fruit salad because uh, my tipuna, they didn't row off to other islands in the Pacific and meet up with the, the wonderful, uh, with their bellies and the ma'umangas, um, the plantations, but 100% um, Samoan. And uh, my father hails from Leolumwenga and my mother hails from Wailima. Um, I do have a title, it's Fonoti, it's from the uh, village of Salimu in Whangaloa. And um, I did actually go there and go through the whole ceremony, but um, that was another story altogether. But um, I have a background in uh, community development, in activism, in demonstrations, in protesting, um, and in also in music. Uh, I was back in my walking days, as I refer it, uh, up until 2005 when I had an accident, had a fall, broke my neck, and I've been in a wheelchair ever since. Um, music has been a big part of my journey, uh, only because my father forced my brothers and I to make a family band, uh, stop playing rugby, and um, that's the only reason why we got into music. So, um, for me, I just wanted to share that, yes, music has been a big part of my journey through the family band. Also, I uh, played in a band called The Holiday Makers back in the day in the mid-80s, a song called Sweet Lovers, and thank you. Um, that, that was my bass line, because I'm a bass player, bass guitar player, and I love grooves and feels, and um, so for me, to be able to have the opportunity to do my own bass line for a song that went to number one, and to also um, use that to set up the co-found, I co-founded the Fitirea Contemporary Music Art, uh, music Program that is now in Te Oaha. And um, thank you. So I really kind of use all this experience now because in the disability world, when I had my accident, for me, those are the dark times, you know, it's just kind of three years and just, um, yeah, just treating people like crap, really. Um, I call it the, my remote control days, you know, when you just get your remote, do this, do that, do that, because those is how, that's how I treated people, that's how I treated my caregivers. But um, lots of learning, and I feel like now it's coming to full circle. It's... I've, in my disability world, uh, I've probably done more now being disabled than I was able-bodied. And um, I've traveled the world, I've been lost in Paris with my caregiver, trying to figure out how to get back to London. Um, I've been to New Delhi and just about, oh, I won't say much more, but that was a real um, adventure. Uh, Edinburgh and also to Disneyland. So, I don't know, if, if people keep saying, oh, it was meant to be, and I thought, mm, yeah, I think so too. So, um, but well, I just wanted to uh, focus a little bit on what we call the, the whakapapa or the ngafa, because we talked about the history of uh, the arts, and I just wanted to say that back in the early 80s, there was a group of us artists who were questioning the then South Pacific Arts Council as to why they were funding just traditional Pacific arts and not contemporary. So for some reason, a small group of us ended up being funded to go to Bulls, which is, <laughs> if you know where Bulls is, or well, there was a house there, there's a whole group of Pacific Island artists. We went there and we had a talk. We got up to a lot of, um, you know, playing and acting and, and the, I think Sam, Samson Samasoni was looking after creating uh, the Pacific Arts then back in the day, so we had the South Pacific Arts, so that was SPAC. 
And I think like Samoan arts, sec. Tokelau arts, tech. So, um, but we managed to form this group called the Contemporary Arts Committee, KEK. And that was the first time that we actually had some funding to provide it to contemporary artists. On that committee was um, Erolia. Yeah, she was on it. Uh, Johnny Benisula, I think his son, is it Lionel Benisula? Uh, Oscar Kitely, Therese Mangos, myself. And so, you know, we started giving out fun. And, and for me, I think that was a key crucial time as to when things started changing before it became created in New Zealand. So I just wanted to acknowledge that group of people because that was quite a critical time back then. Um, in terms of now, I've gone back to my music. I've had the privilege of being able to work with some really amazing people in the disability sector. Sister Lucy. <laughs> and uh, another amazing artist called Rodney Bell. We had the privilege of um, being of performing the first ever disability component to the Kia Mo Festival last year at Massey University. It was an amazing little show. Wasn't well marketed because we weren't quite sure how it was gonna go, but the audience that turned up, they were so moved and they loved it. So I know that some of the people are here. Um, and in that sense, I really want to acknowledge uh, Hone Koka and Media George, um, who are who basically gave us the opportunity to do that and the opportunity also for next year to make it bigger and better for our community. So for us, um, music for me is a powerful tool. It's a powerful tool for us as disabled because especially for Pacifica disabled, it's really inbred in our genes, eh? in culture. And so for us to be able to access that so that we can do it in a way that's appropriate for us so that we can tell our own stories because for so long other people have taken our stories and they've never acknowledged it back to us. They keep taking, they keep saying they'll do this and that but they don't come back to us. And so for us, how can we tell our stories? Well, through music, through arts and we can do it in a way that um, those narratives belong to us. It's unique to us but it's also Amazingly potential, the amazing potential that's there to really bring in our younger people. And we've got some here. And there's a couple here of our young disabled who, are, who have, um, you know, who I've been um, blessed to perform with as well. Um, Lavinia Lovo over there on the side. And she and... Um, <laughs> so we had a, a group um, of young disabled dancers from... Um, from Eileen, who performed with myself at the Pacific Music Awards in 2018, and we opened that show, and it was, um, they were so nervous performing in front of about 4,000 people, because they'd never performed with such a big group before, but man, they did such a good job. Um, and also, um, I'll save it for later, because she's a young, autistic, 19-year-old Tokelau Samoan woman who's here, who's done a recording, so um, we'll save that for later. But music is my buzz, and the feels and the grooves, that's what's in me, so I'm just happy that I have the opportunity to be able to still do that and carry a whole lot of other people, especially the young ones, to come through and uh, so that they can come through and just whisper in my ear when they're ready and say, move over, old man, we're gonna take over now, and, and I look forward to that day. Yeah, I love that day. I love that day, I love one tea. I think, uh, and that's um, as a parent and a carer to someone within the disabled community, one of the things that we've had to learn is time. Uh, because, you know, when you are a full, abled body person, the things that takes time to put on the sock and to move in through the hole or just to make sure they're at the right temperature, you never think about it when you are full and abled body. Uh, but uh, we also forget that in our own histories, there are legends of people from our disabled community. A lot of people are unfamiliar with the story of the Maori story of Hape. If you are unfamiliar with that story, and it says that one of the iwis, when they left the Hawaiki, they left Hape behind because Hape had club feet. Samoa, we call it Sape. I think it's Hape and Tonga as well. 
uh, lo and behold, Happy called up to the gods and had sent the stingray. And Happy got onto the stingray and got here and beat everyone else. So you hear of Karanga Happy, means the call of Happy. So these are some of the legends. In the Samoan context, the highest form of celebratory is by a character you always hear. It says, Wapati ta otole fepo. Little do Samoans know the fepo is blind. But yet the highest accolade of celebration is given to them. So, and I think when religiosity and when colonization came into our community, it labeled us the way it labeled the world. So I think, ladies and gentlemen, what you're seeing is the first ever Tangata Moana superhero panel. <laughs> and the superhero that comes up next, please put your hands together to tell us a little bit about her story and her current art and where it is. Lucy Fiverr. As I am on the Touch Compass Artistic Direction panel over a year now, I'm so grateful to keep practicing my artwork over 26 years now and with Touch Compass and Independent Collaborator almost 30 years. So I'd love to share my experiences and my knowledge of my life as an artist with a living experience disability. I've started work on my new theater inclusive of female storytelling with identity, family and desires. I'm working with Moana ETA and I have a forecast of talented female artists. The piece is called Aga. It'll premiere in 2022. Lucy, can I just say you have an amazing American accent. I'm going to invest into your technology so that in five years' time, somebody's going to sound as fob as I am. <laughs> and then I can finally retire home and be happy. I've made a change in the world. Look, now you get a, a little bit of a picture about our panel this, uh, this afternoon and their story in terms of their art. Now, we're going to move into uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask. Before we got into the disability space, because uh, as you were sharing, you know, I think all of us, uh, you and I especially, were kind of new to the space, whereas Patti came into it in the 80s and Lucy was born um, into hers. In terms of the environment that we're surrounded by, sometimes it's always the fear of how the able-bodied world reacts towards what we do and who we are as a disabled person. In terms of, for you, Tangalosa, what would you like the non-disabled audience that are here today to understand about your journey now versus your journey before, and also where you're measuring your projection from where you are now moving forward as a Pacific disabled to my time? Um, you know, I think that, you know, it's not having that marker um, of a, a wheelchair or a blind dog or something um, that lets you know that um, I have a, a disability. Um, so... It's, I, I think my suggestion is, is a bigger, more universal one, um, which is basically kindness, acceptance, listening and openness, and, and keeping in mind that what you see is not necessarily what's all going on. A, a lot of people... Um, one of my friends calls me calm face because I always look at, as if I have it together. And if you know me from my work, then people think that I'm quite hardcore, you know. Um, but, yeah, I guess, I guess that, that that would be, what I've just said would be really the ideal way to treat everyone, you know. Um, yeah, so, and, and I think feeling for, feeling for someone, but not that weird kind of pity, 
You know, I mean, that's that's quite gross. You know, that that kind of pity thing feels icky, you know. And I think when you're approaching somebody, whether their disability is um, visible or something that you now know about, it can be difficult for you as a non-disabled person to then know what to do with it. You know, it often brings up some, um, some feelings in yourself of like, oh, how do, what, what do I do here? Um, and I think, I think you can be quite open with me anyway about it, you know, because it does, it is often, uh, it's often uncomfortable. It's, of, it's often an uncomfortable space for a non-disabled person to come into contact with a disabled person. Um, but have a go. <laughs> I agree. That's the question, right? Um, I think most people here, one of the things that you need to understand is um, New Zealand went through uh, quite a few phases of, of, of the various treatment models when it came to do to the disability community. The original one that we all know of, which is, was rife in our Pacific community, was the religious one, where everything, you know, if you were born and there was something wrong with your physical attributes, they would always, um, someone, well, in Samoa, if you were born with a missing toe, they said, your daddy ate the pig, or, uh, your, you know, all of these things. And the stigma around it kind of built for our people. And then Aotearoa went through the medical model, where it didn't matter what disability you had, you were just considered sick, and they would try and isolate you. And, and I think it also perpetuated that standoffish when people listen, you know, they were like, oh, yeah, Tusiata, what, she has what? And then all of a sudden, these barriers do uh, sort of come in. But yeah, agree with you I on think, that. So I just think ask the question. I think there's fear there, eh? I think there's some fear there for people mm. having to kind of approach something that that as a disability is different. Oh my God, is she gonna fall on the floor and pee her pants? Or how do I approach a person with a visual disability? How do I approach somebody with a, a very visible um, physical disability? We do feel fear and I think that's okay. I think that's okay, but it's that reminding yourself that you know, we're all human, you know, we all feel the same things. And it's, I guess it's being able to breach that, cross that bridge of fear, you know? Yeah. So just ask the question. Uh, don't just stand there and look wondering. Look, we're gonna cross over to one of the most important questions to me as a part of the supporters of the disability community is those who have the money. I'm gonna ask you for a tea. Creative New Zealand apparently are here taking notes, hearing what our community are saying. What can you put forward as what you feel that uh, the disability space, the Pacific dis uh, disability space requires for those who are creatives? practitioners of whatever their art discipline, if they're hearing today, what is it that you'd like for them to open up, consider, and put more money in it? Or as the man said to the pastor, give me the money. Yeah. Um, I think I'd like to be in the elevator with uh, <laughs> Carmel. And, um, look, I just wanted to just say that um, there's huge potential in our dis disabled arts community. There is, um, you know, in, our, in, in, the, in the sector we say nothing about us without us. And for me, we should be collaborating, we should be co-designing, and we should be capacity building for our, our community. You know, we, we do have the answers, but we've never been given the opportunity to actually sit at the table and design them together for anyone else. So that's what we really want, because when you do that, you start to know that we know where to invest the funding. We know how to utilize that for our own people and for our family with disabled members, you know? So let's do that. Let's have the opportunity for the disabled people to lead 
the change so that we're not being led all the time and allow us to actually promote our community within the Pacific art strategy. You know, um, in 2018, uh, it was, I just about missed that particular summit, but I managed to get in there and um, we talked about involving our people with disabilities within the strategy and, you know, Makarita and team, they've done a lot to do that, to uh, help us to get to this point. Uh, the establishment of the tour award, that was really huge. Um, and to also look at what's available now with our different forums, you know, it's, it's, um, it's really acknowledged and appreciated, but I think to take it to the next level, let us sit alongside and let us co-design this with you to move forward with that. Yep, what he said. Uh, Lucy, what's your response to that same question? What should Creative New Zealand be aware of? What, what can they do for the disability space uh, that they haven't done yet? The big main thing that is accessibility with applying for funding needs to help the disabled artists in different disability communities and organizations. Making it easy understand and simply easy read and other resources are available to support them. I want to have more opportunities for next generation of emerging artists who have been doing their own journey with creating their art for current years and more importantly for the training capacity in the institutions that are available to support them. More international resistance opportunities for the disabled artists. Every time Lucy speaks, I just feel like answering back, howdy partner. Um, yeah, so Creative New Zealand, if you are listening, I think it's more opportunities. I tell you about what you've done so far, uh, but I am someone of low visibility, so I couldn't read that screen. Uh, if you can make it dark gray next time. <laughs> I couldn't even know who was talking, what was being presented, but little things like that, um, you know, just from the side project. Um, just to let you know, tomorrow in our breakout sessions, we'll get time for the community to contribute. So if you have members of your eyeing that are in the disability sector that you think will have a voice that can be added to strengthen Creative New Zealand's approach moving forward, why not, right? Um, the lunch is left over. We, you know, bad lunch is left over lunch. So we need more people to come in here and make use of everything that we've had today. But on that note, I've been signaled we've gone over time. Uh, Lucy Fiber, Lava Fionga for tea. Uh, we will do this again tomorrow, more and more. Pap Tai Taylor for your time. Round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much to our fabulous panel and we're going to take a break for 10 minutes, just 10 minutes and we'll be back here for our last two panels of the day. Thank you everybody.
test. Test.
for the band. Thank you very much, band. If you need to hire them for your wedding, your 21st, your divorce, anything, please come and see me. I know they're very expensive, but I can do you a rate, special rate, family rate. Um, if I could ask everybody to bring your cups of tea back to, back to your seats, because uh, we're going to continue with our last two panels for today. And the next one we've got, Quick Takes panel number three, where the topic is something very dear to my heart. We're talking about leadership. Leadership in our sector. And we're very fortunate to have three leaders in our art sector whom, without their leadership, things would not have happened for our Pacific arts community and our Pacific people uh, generally. And um, sorry, because I can't count four people, four leaders, um, who are going to come up and share the experience. So I'm going to ask our panelists, um, Siuli Terry, Tanya, Leki, and Mesa, if you could please come up to the stage and welcome our fabulous facilitator, um, sponsored by Pantene, the wonderful Paul Lisi. Pantene Provi, Fapte Lava, Molava Noah. Just as we're um, getting our panel 
up on stage. Uh, malo lava, everyone. Talo for lava. Um, as I mentioned previously, um, my name is Paul Lisi. I'm the Arts Practice Director. Um, I wrote down on my notes that I need to introduce myself and my villages. So sorry, Mum and Dad. Um, so uh, my father is from Ngātei Vai in Savai, and my mother is from Manono in Upolu. Kia ora. Malo. Uh, so just as we're getting people um, sorted back into their seats, thank you. Um, this next panel discussion will be looking at leadership. Um, and so uh, one of the, the key things that we're looking at is leadership within the Pacific Arts. Um, as leaders within our community, uh, we'll be looking at what it means to our practice and the way we live and lead our lives, communities and those around us. So um, it's a privilege for me to be here with this esteemed panel um, of leaders who I'm just going to get them to introduce themselves as we go through. Um, and also, um, I might ask if everyone can introduce themselves, introduce their practice, um, and also what you wanted to be when you grew up. So, mole mole lava. When you, yeah, when you grow up, what you wanted to be when you grow up. You can choose not to be grown up, that is totally fine as well. So, I might pass it over to you, Misa. Thank you, Paul. Malo of soy fua. Talo for lava. And thank you for inviting me to be here on this panel. I didn't know whether I wanted to. But I thought it's good to share with you what I remember from the past and the history at my time. I'm Misa Emma Kesha, and I live in Dunedin. I've never seen snow until I went down to South Island. But it's good to be here, and it's good to see all our leaders, I'd like to thank you so much to the Art Board, to Creative New Zealand, to those people who organized us to be here today. Margarita Urale, for Jacinta, who first rang me about this get together. And I thought, thank you so much for remembering me at my age to be here and to tell you my story. So thank you, and God bless. Round of applause, please. Thank you. Uh, to our next panel member, Fatmala Mole, introduce yourself and what you wanted to be when you grew up. Oh, talo for lava. Um, Tanya Moang Zutia. Um, I am a um, musician, um, writer, playwright, theatre maker, producer. I think that's everything. Um, festival coordinator, sorry. Festival director. Um, what I wanted to be when I grow up, I think, I think to be actually really honest, I think I wanted to be either Donna Summer or Irene Cara. <laughs> that, those are the people that inspired me. Is there anything else you need to know? That's perfect. Please, a round of applause for Tanya. For <laughs> say Lava. Uh, next, over to you, Leki. Tu se ma meke koli a ko pun bala eto hapapu hapapa hapapu hapapa lisia la faya hi ha hi ha lisia la faya hi ha hi ha. I had to start with a chant because the Cook Islands been doing all the chants all day, so I just wanted to share a chant from the beautiful island of Niue today. Um, Jackson Burke, New Island. Um, greetings, everyone. No warm Pacific greetings. You guys are already warm today. But um, yeah, my name's Lecky. I am a freelance artist. I do um, <laughs> everything <laughs> and anything. Um, I think I've pretty much worked with majority of the people and arts groups in this room uh, mainly work on stage and screen and yeah dancer singer actor writer producer director and curator and what you wanted to be 
Oh, when I wanted to grow up, I wanted to be a paleontologist. Um, for those of you that don't know what a paleontologist is, it's the um, people that go and dig up the dinosaur bones. <laughs> and the reason I wanted to be that is because um, my favorite character on the TV sitcom Friends was Ross Geller. And I wanted to be Ross, so I wanted to go dig the dinosaur bones, and it didn't work out, so I became an artist. Thank you very much, Lecky Ross. And last but definitely not least, uh, over to you, Seyuli. Um, my name is Seuli Terry Leo Mo'u. I'm the owner of Black Say Productions, um, which is the event company that uh, organises and runs ASB Polyfest up in Auckland, uh, which we we were turning 48 years next year. Uh, yes, yeah, it's so awesome. It's so awesome. Um, I guess. Um, I'm a, um, firstly, I can't, I can't not go with, um, without acknowledging my late parents. And um, so I'm from Mulifungua, which is the um, wharf side of Upolu. And I'm from Salalonga, where is my mom's side, and that's the wharf side of, um, of Savai. And then they met in Auckland and had all their babies there in the, the land of sales. So um, I think um, as a mom um, to an autistic uh, seven-year-old, um, that's, that's where the other creative side of me has come out. Uh, where we've been able to just um, work with her, but being the director of ASB Polyfest has been so rewarding, so challenging over the last few years. And then um, with our Black Say Productions, we're all about repurposing and recycling, upcycling, mea singa, because we've got a lot of our young people who are receiving our mea singa, our taonga, the tapa, the ikongas, but they don't know what to do with it. So we want to try and show them other ways to repurpose it so that they can keep it functional and keep it alive going forward. So that's us. Um, growing up, I wanted to be a drummer. Um, I do drum, I've, and my daughter likes to drum as well. That's her, um, her um, I guess, her calmness for her autism. Uh, I was called, um, nicknamed Animal when I was at um, school because I used to drum and use, um, yeah, drum for our, our choir. So yeah, that's me. Malo Lava, please give it up for Sayuli. <laughs> so. With that, Sayuli, I might actually throw the first question over to you because you spoke so beautifully about it. Um, and you mentioned your work with ASB Polyfest. And I imagine there's a lot of um, hard work there in terms of trying to ensure the next generation of leaders are as prepared as possible. So what do you think you've noticed um, that Pacific Arts leadership looks like in that space for our young people? Our thing is about giving our young people a voice because they are the ones that are telling us what to get ready for. Uh, they've told us to get ready for climate change and climate action. They've told us that um, leadership is to them about keeping their culture alive but in different ways. So I guess um, with um, ASB Polyfest, we're all about pushing leadership um, with our leadership conference that we run at the beginning of the year. It's about equipping them with masterclasses and bringing people around them, like Leki, Tanya, you know, everyone that's around this room. It feels weird for me to sit up here uh, for leadership when there's all these leaders that are sitting out here um, and, you know, within our, our forum here today. But the, um, I guess the things that we've learned from the last few years of... Um, turbulence and, and, and with COVID and um, also to low to our Christchurch brothers and sisters for um, the shootings that happened down there because it affected us up in Auckland as well, is the fact that um, our kids are resilient. They're resilient kids. Our, our, our community are resilient, but they, um, they can't not see this happen. And I know that there's been some families that came to us and wondered why we didn't go ahead in some years. You know, um, it's the safety of our kids that's always paramount to us. But at the same time, we've learned a lot from um, these last few years in regards to how to make the most of the digital platforms, how to um, just work differently, to work differently, and also how to be feisty with um, other ministries and other leadership. So thanks to CNZ, um, I'm also proud to be the co-chair of the Pacifica Festivals Initiative. And I know that I see um, quite a few of our other festivals that are here, their collaborative voice that's leadership. That's leadership when we can come together in one room, big or small, and be able to just fight for what's right for our kids and for those who are going to come after them. Malo lava. And speaking of, I guess, resilience, and especially within that festival space, Tanya, your work um, as the um, 
as you had said, the coordinator, but really you're, you're helping to run the show, the, the Polyfest down there. Um, how have you been finding um, the next generation of, of young leaders come through, uh, particularly through the, through the Polyfests, as well as all the work that you do in festivals? Um, what are you noticing, um, the, the leadership style, or what are you noticing of the next generation of leaders? Um, I think with festivals generally, in terms of how long I've been doing festivals, um, um, and how long ago I started doing festivals, is that there's still this mentality that festivals isn't a job, like organising a festival isn't a job, unless it's very visible. So, so Polyfest and the support that Polyfest gets in Auckland is awesome because people can see it on TV. And so I think it's, um, it's just really um, dressing up those roles so that they are more tangible for our young people. So it may be production, it may be called something else, but it's actually really, you're part of a bigger team. So I think with um, what I learnt from um, Otago Festival in Otipoti is that um, the ki this came from the community. This is a festival that has been grown from the community. So there's a pool of about a dozen people that could probably just lead that festival blind. You know, So when I've come in with the support of Creative New Zealand, I've been able to put in certain things in place that might be more of the festival event you know, industry standards, whatever that means, but it's just about empowering those young people who have come from ECEs, you know, they're the little babies and they've come up to primary school, they've performed at high school and then they've been volunteering. So I was actually saying to them, you know what, that job that you do when you move that guitar and you put that over there for that man and then you pack up that drum and then you put that over there for that group, that means that you're a stage technician and you could probably work for the rest of your life in that world. You know, it's just giving them some good industry knowledge to say that that's actually the thing that you already know how to do you know we're the only ones who know how to work with our pacific instruments in our bands that's so that's so important and they've got these awesome leadership down there with Hiliako um down there you know leading these kids coming up on stage helping the groups get together you know so it's just sort of that um it's the knowledge it's just letting everybody know and the young people know that it's, it's so important and poly, all the polyfest all the festivals all the gatherings They've all, you know, there's all these specialised roles that are all very important, but we're the only ones who know how to do it with, in terms of our Pacifica space, our Moana space, sorry. Malo, and um, I guess speaking to that um, innate understanding of who we are as Pacifica people and just understanding the way that we are with each other, and also um, it was beautiful that we were able to hear from our Matua panel about um, the, the knowledge, the sharing of the knowledge and the passing of, of the knowledge. Um, I just want to turn to you, Misa, as a founding member of uh, Pacifica. Back then, what, what did you kind of envisage or see in terms of the future for Pacific Arts, particularly within your area of expertise, which is weaving? Um, right. You know, how, how did you find uh, working with organizations like Pacifica to help train the next generation of weavers, for example, yeah. or leaders. Okay. How did you find that? Thank you. I like to talk about Pacifica Women Organization first, because there was no organization in New Zealand of the Pacific, nothing. But our founder was Patty Walker, who was a city councillor of Auckland. And she was a good friend with Muldoon. And she thought women are the backbones of any home and families. And they work hard. And when you go home, you know, men, the Matais, they're doing a lot of talks. But who does all the work? <laughs> you know. So anyway, Patty Walker thought of an idea. Our women came to this country to work. I came to this country before I was 18 in 1958. And I can relate really well with Patty Walker when she came down. She thought of an idea to set up the women's organization and to call it Pacifica. And what a good idea. Pacifica stands for Pacific Allied Women's Council, inspired faith and ideas concerning all. And she asked Mr. Maldon Round of applause money. for that. Thank you. Oh, is that all? Keep oh. going, keep going, please. So she asked Mr. Maldon for some money so she can travel around the country. And so he gave her 20000 
So Patty Walker came down. Well, they had a meeting in uh, Tokoroa, somewhere in North Island. I didn't go because uh, I didn't know about it. But then she came down to Invercargill, where I was with my family. And she came, and we had a meeting with a minister's wife. And uh, the minister's wife, minister's wife called all us Pacific Island people, uh, the Samoan, the Tongan, the Cook Islanders, um, you know, you name it, and went, all those islands were down there, so we came together. And she talked to us, and to me, it really opened my eyes and my ears. She said, you know, you came here, and you work hard, you built your home, and you still have, haven't got a voice. You still haven't got a voice to speak. And we all we all for it. And she said, what do you think? So we all have a turn to get up and say, let's start the organization of Pacifica. So we started in, in Macaco in 1975, and I was a founder uh, member of uh, in Macaco, and I came up to Dunedin, <laughs> and I, I joined Pacifica in Dunedin branch, but later on, I set up another branch. Patty Walker said to me, set another branch, because there's a lot of people there, because sometimes only the people of some church are going to the one branch. But open one branch so that everyone can come. So I open another branch. We call it Dunedin Central Pacifica. Dunedin Central branch has started from 1982 until now. And um, so, 19, uh, well, I was in the Art Council Committee during that time. And so I've learned to, uh, to do things as a woman. Uh, was encouraged by our leader, Patty Walker. And she also said, when you're in a group, when you're in a meeting, if it's not with the way you think, put your hand up and nominate yourself. If you have a, um, a heart and a mind and a mouth to speak, do it. And you know, I've been naughty, I've been doing that. <laughs> and it's good because you have to be strong. You have to be, you know, be a good example. You have to keep teaching because we can weave people together. We can, you know, love each other. Love is something that you give it away and it'll come back to you. So. Malo, pati pati mai. I, I don't think there needs, there's nothing else to be said. That was, that was a brilliant answer. Um, and kind of going off on that, on um, kind of being strong and being in those spaces where um, you are a lone voice, I just want to turn to, to Leki and the work that you do, particularly with your Nuean community um, and I guess the wider diaspora. How have you been finding um, being a leader in that space? Or do you consider yourself a leader in that space? Because I can see your eyes are like, what is this question? Well, over to you, bro. What, what do you think um, it takes to be a leader in this space? I'm a thick skin and a sharp mouth in order to navigate the Nguyen community because we're not the easiest people. I'm sure the Nguyen's in the room will agree with me, our community. Like all the other Pacific communities, we have our challenges. Um, that we have to navigate and go through. I guess being a New Zealand-born Nguyen, my problem was always um, language, obviously. Vangahau Niue was not my first language. I grew up learning English. So I learned Vangahau Niue myself through the arts, self-taught, and from my elders. Um, and then I guess having, having that little grasp, you know, that was my tool to navigate the Nguyen community. And um, I really had to, like, reassess and think about um, my, how, how I'm uncomfortable in some of those new spaces because at the end of the day when we do our arts work it's not for us, it's for our ancestors and it's for our culture and to keep it alive so that outweighs my 
the benefits of that outweigh my insecurities. So now I don't even care if the New England community go and talk about me, join the club, I'll just make a show about you and then I'll <laughs> put it up on stage. And that's actually what I did with one of my works. Um, this New England person in the community was talking about me on Facebook. So I went and screenshot all the comments and I put it into my script and that's how I channel my art. Um, I don't know if that's leadership, but it works. And, <laughs> and the new and young people come and they have access to the culture through the arts because they can come and they can sing and they can dance and they can go, oh, I can't speak new and, but um, you know, visibility is important when they see themselves represented on stage and screen, then they know that's us. We can be like that as well, regardless of whether we have our language or not. Um, and new and statistically, we, we've been told we have the worst language stats of all the Pacifica nations in New Zealand. So we've been described as the fastest dying Pacific language. So to me, that's, that responsibility falls on my shoulders. I don't really care about the community politics because at the end of the day, you guys are all going to die. And then, was, and then I'm stuck, you know, like, oh my gosh, what happens when the old people die? And then like, she died with her song and he died with her story. And like, you know, so um, yeah, I've been stealing everyone's songs and stories and I'm going to keep doing it unapologetically because... It's to serve new way, and at the end of the day, that outweighs um, all the politics in our community. Um, so yeah, that's my idea of leadership. Oh, my lord, <laughs> round Thank of applause you. for that one, oh. my lord. And you touched on a really, um, I guess, important part, which segues into uh, my next question uh, quite beautifully. It's like I planned this. Um, one of the big things I guess we as Pacifica people understand innately is that we lead by service or tautua. Um, and so my question to the panel is, um, why do you think service or tautua is an important part of how we lead as Pacifica people? Why do you think it's, it's an important part? I might throw to Misa, but mole mole lava. Why do you okay. think tautua? We all know our Samoan saying, ole ala ele pule ole tautua. Um, the path to leadership is to serve. And when I grew up in Samoa, I used to come home from school, I couldn't find my mother and my grandmother. You know, women have their center Langa, the house of weaving, they weave all day. And weaving is our wealth. We have mats, lots of mats for the floor to sleep on, baskets to put food in and bring the food from the plantation, or to carry the fish from fishing, uh, the hats to wear on your head from the sun, the, the heat of the sun, and the fans to fan yourself, a lot of things. So I used to come home, change my clothes, have something to eat, and I know where they find them. I know where I found my mother and my grandmother. So I went to the Falelalanga, to the house of weaving, and that's where they were. So I start weaving with them. I weave their leftover flax and I create. They taught me how to make fish, birds, um, you know, the square, balls, we used to make them out of uh, coconut leaves, and we used to uh, play catching as little kids those days. And as I started doing real weaving with my mother, I used to help my mother to finish her products for the, um, the tourist market in Apia, Samoa. So I was a good weaver. Weaving was already in my blood before I came here. So when I came here, I thought, well, why should I weave? We have got carpets, and we've got everything. We can buy bags from a shop and hats. So um, the dream of Ngoi Befarangi at the art board, she's from north. She's also. Um, the music, the what do you call it? She did, um, yeah, she's, uh, she dreamed that women of uh, Maori and Pacific people should share their artwork, mm -hmm. their weaving. Weaving wasn't an art those days. It's just a woman's job or a man's job. So 
you know, everything worked for the betterment of us here in New Zealand. And uh, weaving became an art form. So that was so fantastic. You know, I came up with an idea. I, I read on a newspaper when I, when I was in Dunedin. We shifted from Invercargill to Dunedin, and I read it. And I said to my husband, this is a great idea. You know, I was living with my mother, and now this is an idea for me to create something. So I applied to Creative New Zealand for funding to start my multicultural weavers in Dunedin in 82. So I forgot the name. Her mother, I mean, the girl was speaking here before. Her mother was in uh, Creative New Zealand. She came down to interview me about my dreams and uh, about setting up the multicultural weavers. And I told her, well, the dream of Ngoi Pefarangi wanted to share Māori and Pacific people. And I like to shrub my shoulders with Māori people and to, to weave their, their harakeke. So that was all right. It was good to have, um, um, well, I got the funding and I started my multicultural weavers in 1983. And I start weaving. I weave at a marae. And when all these things happening and people heard about it, I got invited to a lot of places and especially Pacifica branches all over the country. So they said for me to come and teach them. And I said, what budget do you have? And they said, nothing. We're going to um, fundraise. I said, apply to Creative New Zealand. They got money to give you, to help you. So they did. In Tokorua, they applied for some money, and I went to teach them. And uh, you know, I always play my ukulele and sing my uh, theme song. I welcome the people in my, um, in my group, and then I open with a prayer. So, um, and I also play the ukulele for Pacifica every time we meet in our conferences. So they, they bought some ukulele from the funding that they got from Great New Zealand, and uh, it was um, school holidays. So not only teaching them weaving, but I was teaching them how to play the ukulele. Um, you know, I taught them how to tune the ukulele first, and then we all play the ukulele with our party songs. Amazing. Uh, do you think that um, your service has been through your weaving, your service? Would you say that your service as a leader has been through your weaving? I think my weaving was known, was well known for the things that I do differently. I was invited to, um, to Christchurch for 10 years during the art festivals. Every February, under the umbrella of uh, underground, Pacific underground, with Tanya and Postma Wanger, and I never fail turning up every year, because I love rubbing shoulders with people. We started at our centre, and in the following five years, we were hosting, um, hosted by um, the museum in. Canterbury. Fantastic. Round of applause, please. <laughs> Round of applause. I know we've been given um, the time to wrap up, so uh, one more question for the rest of the panel. Um, I want to, um, what's one piece of advice that you could tell your younger self? You have 30 seconds each, a piece of advice to your younger self. My younger self. Um, piece of advice to my younger self. Um, speak up. Sit in that room, get involved, um, sit, um, respect your elders, respect your mamas and your papas, respect the art form, respect their ancestors. Malo, round of applause, please. <laughs> Licky, next. Um, just three words, don't do it. And uh, <laughs> there's a little story behind that. When I was in high school, I, told, I met Oscar Kiley. And I told Oscar Kali, I was like, Oscar, I want to be like, I want to be a famous actor when I grow up, and I want to do this and that. 
And I go, do you have any advice for me? And he goes, don't do it. And then he walked away and he slammed us taxi door. And then I hated him for five years. And I was like, oh my gosh, what a, like that was his advice to me. And then I always like had this thing against Oscar. Then I met him. <laughs> then I went through drama school. I finished and then I became a playwright. Then I did all this stuff. Like about seven years later, I met him at a workshop and I go, Oscar, do you remember um, seven years ago, you told me don't do it. I just want to say I proved you wrong and I didn't listen to you. And then he goes, then it worked. And I was like, <laughs> what do you mean? And he's like, and then we unpacked it. We sat, we sat there and talked for about an hour. And he said to me, he goes, if, if I say to you, don't do it, and you didn't listen, then you're supposed to be an artist because you're resilient and you don't care what other people think about you. And you need to have that thick skin when you navigate the arts world because everyone's going to tell you, you should do this, do your show like this, you should do this. But if you just trust your instincts and trust your gut and f follow what you want to do in your vision, then you're going to do it unapologetically. And so those are my three favorite words now that I always say to young people, don't do it because then you'll know um, if they're going to sink or swim. So that's, that's my advice to myself. Don't do it. Malo, pak pak mai, family mol lava. Malo, 30 seconds. Uh, and last but not least, Sayuli. Um, I'd say you learn to be a gong or learn to um, do a sweet sound. And you need to know both those languages to speak to the people who are funders. Um, before you asked to, um, why Tautua, because our parents did it, our grandparents did it, you know, the act of duplication. And we're going to continue to do that. No more businesses, they finish with, a, with an event and it's done in those four days. We continue to tell tour with our community, so straight after. So be a gong, be a sweet sound, learn to be both, and you know, and just be able to capture the hearts of those who provide the funding. Mālo lava. And with that, we hope we've been a sweet gong for you um, here in the room and also online. Thank you for joining us. Um, once more, please give it up for this amazing panel. Round of applause, and we'll get Karen up to introduce our next session. Fafzai Lava. Thank you very much um, to Misa um, for your leadership through Pacifica. Uh, thank you to Gunny and to Pos for your leadership in, in the huge space you've made. Thank you to Leki for breaking open the VAR and telling it like it is, um, because I think we've got more of those conversations to have over the next couple of days about how we, the joys of working for our people. And finally, to Seuli for your uh, leadership in the festival space. And thank you very much, Paul, for your skillful facilitation. So we're moving on to the last panel of today, Quick Takes panel number four. And this is on the digital moana. So you know, we came from great navigational technicians, and this is just kind of the next navigation that we've got to make. And I'm thrilled that we have here today um, to share their thoughts with us. Michael Mulipula, Katrina Yosio, Media George, Jessica Paralangi, and facilitated by the beautiful Catherine George. Give them a hand. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Kia ora tato ka I'm Catherine George, and I work in Creative New Zealand's uh, international team. Um, I'm excited to talk about this subject today because we know that digital technologies are fundamentally changing the way that we create art, uh, it's changing the way that we distribute art, and it's changing the way that we experience art. It's also changing the way uh, of how we make a living with our art. So, um, but what does, it, what does digital actually look like for our artists? I'm so privileged to host this panel of speakers, Media George, Jessica Balalangi, Faith Wilson, Katrina Yosia, Mikhail Molipula, who will share with us today what digital means for their practice and what it might look like in the future. So uh, welcome everybody. I will ask you to introduce yourselves and share with us what digital looks like in your practice. Um, make it easy, we'll start from, from the right here with, with Cousin. Here we go. <laughs> kia ora Cousin. Um, kia ora na koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. E fui fui mai nei tēnei rangi. Um, ko Vaitaia, ki te tahau o tōku māma no te arua me Ngāti Awa o ku iwi. Ki te taha o tōku pāpa, ko Enua Manu mai tōku pāpa ruau. Ko Tumutu Varovaro mai tōku māma ruau. Um, no, um, 
Akaua Aho. My name is Media George. This is my cousin. And then I have another cousin down here. And for me, that has been very much the, um, uh, the creative experience is a, a practice that began as a child. And um, it's, it's a play space that is boundless. And that's what the digital space now has become for me. My practice is as a, um, originally as a, a playwright, but playwright, floor sweeper, a picker upper, a, um, producer, director, um, and now I'm working within uh, storytelling uh, in the stage and digital space as well. Um, the digital space for me is a new space for us. I am the executive director of Kiamo Festival as well as the co-director of Tawata Productions and we've been interested in the digital space as a place where we can um, bend time and space, where we can reach across to Wananui Akiva and sit with our, our cousins, whether they're in the island, <laughs> cousins, whether they're in the islands or Turtle Island across the world, as if we would sit at a fireside. That's what the digital space can be. Also, it can be a space where we can document our stories, where we can ensure that the visibility and the representation of, of our aunties, mothers and grandmothers is, is shared as widely as it can reach. So it's, it's crossing space and time. We're also expanding from a Kiamo Festival uh, perspective, we're uh, expanding live performance into the digital space. So our our digital theatre, Moana Nui, echoes what happens within our live space. It is not a, it is not a random event, it's a, it's a digital house of resonance that follows on from our live performance programme. That, in a nutshell, is what the digital is to me. Jessica? Yeah, thank you. Um, My name is Jessica Palalangi. Um, I'm wearing a mask because I swear I got sick last time we went to karaoke and someone jammed the mic down their throats and then everyone got sick from that. So um, I'm sure you can hear me fine though. Um, I uh, currently the Kaifakahaire um, of the Arts Foundation. Um, I also just joined the board of Taltai, which was a real privilege. Um, it's actually really amazing to be here. I've been away for a long time. So I was in London for 16 years and so kind of really missed a lot of this um, I guess the trajectory that is being displayed today and the success of the strategy and it's really amazing. I, I'm kind of jealous. I want to be a child of the strategy as well. I feel like that's <laughs> the mantra, you know? Where's that t-shirt? Um, so yeah, I was away for a long time and I guess it, it speaks to um, what I think the digital space is. Um, I'm part of a collective called Inter Island Collective which is based in London but it's also based here in Aotearoa. Um, and that was my first kind of foray into intentionally going into the digital space was when um, we just didn't really know how to connect to our, you know, families and communities here. Um, we felt quite cut off during uh, COVID anyway, but really we had all been abroad for so long and we started to think about these stories that we were sharing with um, mainly European audiences where did they come from? You know, why were we, where, what was our tether? And so we really needed to reach out back to our communities here, our families here, and just be grounded again. And so the digital space, in its amazing fiber optic way, um, helped us do that. Um, and I think we're still figuring out what that means. Um, so I guess I'm sitting here with many hats on, as always, like we all are, you know, we contain multitudes. So um, yeah, really excited to hear from everyone else. Uh, Jessica, thank you. Faith. Um, Talupa, beautiful people. My name is Faith Wilson. Um, I am, what am I? Um, I'm a writer, editor, and I'm the Pacific Arts Legacy Intern, sponsored by Creative New Zealand at Penguin Random House New Zealand Books. Um, and I've also launched my own uh, small poetry press called Salfo'i Press, which um, publishes Pacific poetry in Aotearoa. Um, and yeah, had my first experience, uh, experience of um, publishing a book, the first book, just a couple of months ago. No, in September last month. Um, so 
I guess it's a bit weird because I'm making physical books, which sort of seems like the opposite of digital, but um, I guess I sort of see the digital, uh, sorry, the physical book as part of like a bigger thing. So while the book itself is something you hold in your hand, it's got, um, I guess, tentacles that uh, and go into the digital and whether that's the kind of relationships, um, the, re the relationship um, of the writer um, and the kind of stuff that they have online or out there in the world. Um, I don't know, the sort of like paratext or all the other things surrounding that have informed that book to kind of come into the space. Um, I guess it's, it's something that has lots of different relationships out there. So um, in previous lives, I have had more of a digital practice um, as an artist through performance on social media, which <laughs> I hope no one remembers that because it's kind of embarrassing. Um, but yeah, I'm sort of enjoying actually being a producer of um, on books at the moment. Malo Faye, thank you. Katrina. Uh, my name is Katrina Yosia. I'm a multidisciplinary artist. I started out sculpting with physical materials. Um, I've actually interwoven my practice into um, the digital arts. So I'm actually now doing augmented reality um, designing and developing um, of my works. I'm also a creator with Snap Spectacles, the AR powered glasses, um, and that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Fakawelahi, Katrina, and Mikael. Creator of New Zealand giving me a live mic. That's a bad idea. My lawless switch for my Malilangi Mama, Oloingua or Macau Mulipola. My grandfather uh, is from Lefanga, Iva Manono. My grandmother is a Solomona from Papasatoa, Faliasiu, uh, Vaimoso, and Sinamonga. Uh, Wellington, uh, Poneke, has a big place in my heart. It's my second hometown. Newtown PIC Solomonas. That's my family. Uh, that's, my, that's my grandmother's brother, Leme. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, what don't I do? Um, yeah, I'm a Pacific arts outlier. Uh, I'm a professional comic book artist, professional wrestler, professional gamer, professional driver, professional writer, actor, stuntman, Duffy Books and Homes role model, award-winning, Arts Pacifica awards losing, um, <laughs> Digital Fellowship, Guinea Pig, uh, and all around shit story. Um, but my current role is as a story artist for Disney Animation Studios. And uh, I just want to just pub publicly state that Creative New Zealand had zero, zero involvement with me getting that Disney job, just so that it stops them from trying to ride my coattails. Um, but yeah, so for me, the digital space uh, is, is a var. It's, it's what connects us, it's what binds us in this new age, especially with post-COVID and the COVID uh, situation we found ourselves in. And so that's how we've been able to connect to one another uh, through borders and whatnot. And uh, I'm of the age where I grew up analog and then kind of came into digital, so I get the best of both worlds. Um, and I love new technologies. Uh, I don't explore them as, 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 as crazily as Katrina does with AR and VR stuff. Uh, but, you know, I've utilized the digital space, the VAR, to connect with people from all around the world. Uh, and with my Disney work, um, I get to do that from Māngere. Uh, that's where I'm from. I'm a proud son of Māngere. And so using the digital VAR, I get to create Disney work in Māngere while, co while connected to people in Los, Van Los Angeles. So for me, it's just another, it's a, it's a modern version of the VAR in terms of what it connects us, it binds us, it's an ether, it's ethereal, like you can't really tell what it is physically, but we know we can connect to people across the void, and that's our VAR, that's our relationship through the digital moana and the digital VAR space. Marlo, Miguel, all the talent, all the hats, thank you. Um, <clears throat> we know that technology is evolving very rapidly, and we know that some of us are at that sort of early stage of integrating um, digital in our practice, and some of us are more further along. Um, I'd be keen to know um, from anyone what uh, has, what are some of the factors that have enabled your digital practice um, to sort of push you along? Um, who would like to start off there? 
for Katrina, because uh, you're doing a lot in that uh, ARVR space. Tell us about what you've been doing um, and, and really what, how you even um, got that Snapchat Google gig. I mean, how do you even connect with those people? So I actually started out, um, it was just a fun project and I was just exploring the space at the time, so this was a couple of years ago, and um, I wanted to turn one of my physical works into something that was more digital. Um, at the time, there was no COVID, so I was still in the beginning um, of that era. And um, I thought, you know, let's just make something and I'll see how it goes. Decided to publish it, and then um, apparently it went viral. Um, and then eventually I got this email and it was like, you know, let's set up a meeting and it was from somebody from Snapchat's um, program. And after that, I just thought, oh, maybe this is a big joke, you know, because as bus speaker people, we like playing little pranks. And um, so I found out later on that it wasn't because this person had a LinkedIn. Um, later on, we set up a Zoom meet and um, I was invited to be on their program. So ever since then, I've kind of just like, navigated my way through the space, so now I'm like working along and working in other spaces as well, like with Spark AR, designing and also developing um, works for, you know, commissioned works that go and they're available in, for Instagram and Facebook users. So that's um, how far I've come as well. Um, and also with the Snap Spectacles, um, being the only pair that was here in Aotearoa, I was able to start working and designing for that about a year ago now. So yeah, um, at the moment, just kind of just going with it, so yeah. And do you think that um, that initial connection with Snapchat has sort of had a ripple effect with all these other people, all these other jobs that you're now getting? Um, is it sort of, was the origin from Snapchat or how have you managed to sort of make connections to keep your um, digital practice going? Uh, most definitely. I started out um, just putting my work out there on the social platforms um, because I didn't know anyone on this side of the world that was doing the same thing. So it was just a way of trying to find a community that was out there. Um, we're a couple of years in and I've met some really amazing people that have been really supportive and, you know, they've given me, you know, handy tips and tricks of how to navigate my way in this space as well. Um, because it is pretty difficult, like, when you're the only one out there, um, and you're trying to make connections as well, but also, you know, maintaining, you know, your cultural aspects of your work as well. Fascinating. And um, Media, you also, of course, um, created the Moana Nui digital platform and would be really keen to um, know how you got into that and what some of the challenges were and what sort of opened the path for you to create that, that platform. I just, um, yes, yeah. One of the things about Moana Nui and that was so important for um, Kiamo and the collective that I work with, our community, was to be sovereign, was to have a sovereign space where we were responsible for, for the kaupapa that led the space, that it was our worldview that was centred. That's what drove the vision of Moana Nui, that's what drove the vision of Kiamo Festival. So. Um, Hune Koka, our artistic director, had been talking to his cousin, see how this actually works to all of our young ones in the space. He was talking to his cousin who mentioned um, a company in Hamilton called Shift 72. Shift 72 build film festivals um, online for Cannes Film Festival, South by Southwest, and now for Kiamo Festival too. To subvert their experience um, of us, we are the only live performance festival <coughs> that is utilising their technology. So Moana Nui means that we can, that our artists, that our communities can lead the narrative. Uh, and it means that we can keep uh, chasing our dreams, I guess, chasing our vision. Our, the challenges of this space have been that we're live performance artists, we're, use, we're used to hustling, I think as an earlier panel was saying, to hustling um, in the real world. We had to learn what a hustle was like in the digital space and how to, to learn quickly to ad adapt our storytelling so that it still maintained its, its essence and still maintained it in, um, in 4K if possible. Um, so we could ensure that our stories were of the utmost quality 
as our artists would have wanted them. It's, it's a space of sovereignty for us, and it means that we can lead everything that happens from that digital theatre. And um, I'm interested, did, were you, did you understand the language, so you worked with Shift 72, was it? Um, and obviously they're a very big company if they're working with those big international platforms. So was it, do they speak the same language or did you have to learn um, new ways of um, engaging with them and learning new digital uh, capabilities? You know, the thing is, I'm from a time that's called the 80s and so we didn't grow up with the digital world. So um, for me, it was very much learning um, those skills from social media, but also I've been working in the film industry, so I was quickly learning um, that language and that vocabulary too, could it be adapted to that space? Shift 72 seemed to think everything is very simple and quite straightforward, and it isn't. But we have a, we have a small team, but a growing team, who are becoming familiar with this technology. So it means that, you know, as we do, we throw the door open and we get as many of our cousins to take off their shoes and leave them at the front door and then make themselves at home. So I think, to be honest, I think young people are speak digital. Um, that's perhaps one of their native languages. Um, it's probably my fourth or fifth, but um, it's, a, it's a very useful language to ensure that uh, we can lead the narrative. Fascinating. And um, Faith, of course, you um, uh, were part of the Boosted Ex Moana program. It'd um, be interesting to hear your experiences of um, actually using a digital platform to essentially um, generate income for your um, project. Yeah, um, so the, I guess in that sense, um, the digital is like a big part of South Pauli Press's ngapa because I don't think it would exist in the way it does and have the awareness that it does without the boosted ex Moana campaign. Um, because what started out, you know, like I, ha I know some people, but I don't know that many people. And I think um, the word really spread through being part of that collective group of people who are asking for money because it's no one really likes asking for money. It's really hard. Um, and so when you're doing it together in a really supported way um, with all the cool graphics and all the, you know, um, other people with more clout than I do, sort of giving it um, cred, then it felt a lot better. But it was a very humbling experience because the support that the community did um, give, through, whether it was like financial or just putting the word out there was huge and immense and um, it just is a, a reflection of, I guess, the needs and wants of, of parts of our community. So yeah, it was cool. Absolutely. And um, Mikhail, with, um, you know, working in all the, all, all the different spaces that you're working in, um, has it been, and because you're so experienced in this space and now you're working with Disney, are there any, are you learning anything new or um, how, what has that process been like for you? Yeah, uh, being part of the inaugural Digital Fellowship, um, you know, a program with the uh, Creative New Zealand and Arts Council of Australia, uh, which Katrina was also in as well. I learned a whole new world about the AR and VR spaces, and it, it showed me the possibilities of those mediums and how you can tell stories in the digital world. I haven't really taken the step towards that stuff yet, because it's still kind of beyond my grasp uh, at the moment, but like, it was amazing just to know what can be done in those spaces. In terms of like how I use digital tools, um, I've been kind of using a, a digital uh, illustration software since 2007. Uh, I utilized social media at its inception to, uh, for promotion um, and whatnot. So like I've always kind of been intrigued and fascinated by new technologies and how you can use them, but more for um, I guess promotion and uh, and you know of my work because I was in my own space. I still am in my own space. Like you Google someone comic book artist, it's just me. Um, and so I kind of had to utilize those new avenues because I had control over those. Um, you know, I did. I didn't go through the Creative New Zealand system. I self-funded my my success myself. Like there are no strings on me. Um, so I just had to find new ways to get my work out there, to connect to an audience, build an audience, 
and that's why I found it's so much easier now with the digital space because it's easy, as I said, it's a vow to connect to people, not just in your own community, but all around the country and other countries and around the world. So that's how I've kind of used it and utilized it. Um, I haven't really kind of, yeah, kind of gone into the whole matrix aspect of it, um, but I, I, I can see that that's where the future is. And I guess the one thing that I've seen now with the advent of new technology uh, in, the, in the digital space, art space particularly, is the, the rise of AI art. And uh, that stuff just pisses me off, to be honest. Because um, so many people on social media are claiming to be artists, but all they did was just type certain words, put it into an AI machine, and this ugly thing comes out. And then they're like, we're artists just like you. And it's like, you have not put in the damn work. You know, and if anything, you're a manager than, more than an artist, because you just put in words, and then something came out. And it's, uh, so that's, I think, part of the, the dangers of, of the digital uh, spaces is the, I guess, um, almost uh, what was it? the parasitic uh, kind of uh, behaviors. Um, you know, you kind of saw the NFTs um, as well, which I am not a big fan of. Um, but um, yeah, just this, this, this weird kind of space that we're finding ourselves in, especially with AI art. So I'm interested to see how that builds and, and where that goes, hopefully it dies. Absolutely, and I, I think also, I mean, you raise a good point, is that, um, and we all know that digital is, um, it, is going to open so many opportunities for so many of us, but it, at the core of it, um, it is, it's absolutely about the art, and it's not just about the, the bells and whistles of these, of these apps and the technologies that are coming. Jessica? Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, I totally agree with you in one way around the AI. I think it's scary. But like, how do we increase access to the space is something I'm really interested in because um, a lot of the, I guess, our ability to excel in the space is based on our accessibility to the tools and the technology, right? Um, and from what I know, CNZ is not um, funding capital expenditure, so not buying these things. So I think one of the things and the challenges I'd love to put out to not only us, but to, I guess, our funding bodies is how do we increase the accessibility of these technologies so that we can actually play and excel in this field? Um, you know, can we think about more creative financial solutions that can unlock things? Um, we work in collaborative spaces all the time. Why don't we share resources? So just, I think, I totally agree that it's not about um, this open access can be to you know, um, I guess Wild West in so many ways, but you know, there is a real issue with the digital divide, I guess not only in terms of devices, but like access to Wi-Fi. Um, so yeah, so I, just, I don't know if anyone else wants to speak to that, but you know, that's just something that I come up against quite a lot. Thank you. I think a really, interest I think a really interesting, um, I guess a nuance to what Jessica's saying is that um, I think it came from an initiative from TPK and that a lot of um, rural marae throughout the country have fabulous Wi-Fi connection because of that um, government-funded initiative. Um, I know certainly where my mother's family are from in Horohoro, which is south of Rotorua. Um, you can always spot where all the kids are because they're huddling around a corner in the kitchen because that's the strongest point of Wi-Fi. That's a marae that does not get phone reception. So I think you could also say if there's, a, if there's an emergency, there's a um, faster access to um, communication, but also that's a massive access point, and I wonder if there was any kind of pathway for access like that throughout our um, arts organisations. Um, in town here in Wellington, at Toy Pōneke, where we are resident, we're a resident company, we have the worst... Wi-Fi access, and a lot of Moana Nui, which began programming last year, took place from our homes, that we had to go home to upload from there. But the conversations around data poverty and, um, and lack of access to hardware and equipment is a, a really important conversation too. Um, as a gamer, the first problem is Wi-Fi. Uh, or <laughs> you've got to be cabled. Um, but um, yeah, the digital divide is definitely a, a huge issue, particularly for uh, in the Māori and Pacifica communities, you know, Lower Desau, 
our lower socioeconomic communities, you know, in an in increasingly digital uh, age, the digital divide means that our, our people are uh, you know, a few steps behind. And I think if there are ways that we can kind of um, plug that gap, you know, through CNZ funding or other initiatives, like Digital Tour, who uh, supply uh, laptops for, uh, you know, communities that need it. And I've, I've donated a few uh, laptops to them because, I, you know, I, felt, I I can't, I can't be uh, thriving off digital uh, technologies and not have, and, and living in Māngere and having people in Māngere not have a laptop for their kids. So, um, so that's definitely one of those, those um, organisations that are trying to plug that gap, but you know, they can only do so much. And so, yeah, if we can find ways to you know, create uh, less of a divide for our people uh, in that digital space, especially where everything is going with AR and VR, um, that would be an amazing thing. I'd love to see that. Absolutely. So it's just getting us on the on the same um, uh, level with having j just the right tools to to get to get going. And Jessica, did you want to say something else? I was yeah. just going to ask Auntie Macarita if she would do afterpay for any digital devices. <laughs> <laughs> if that was something that could be written down, yeah, that was all. And um, also, I mean, kind of on the flip side of that also is how digital can also help us to generate income through online platforms. And, and I know we've had different experiences with that. So does anyone want to talk to how um, online and digital practice can also be another way of generating income? Um, yeah. Uh, you just kind of do the work and they pay you for it. Um, <laughs> Invoice them on time, and then hopefully they'll pay you on time. Um, that's how I've managed but, but to make. How do you how do you charge? Like, how do you get to that point where you know how much you can charge and that kind yeah. of stuff? Yeah. Well, now that I'm working for Disney, my rates have gone up, guys. So sorry. Oh. Um, but it's yeah, it's definitely over years. Like you know, where you, you start off small, right? Because you're you're just trying to build your portfolio. You know, I've been through all of that, and then it gets to the point where you, you know you're doing stuff for WWE, you're doing stuff for Marvel, and you're like, you know what, my rates have gone up, and it's it's a matter of as you do more work and you put more work out there, and you do higher profile uh, projects, you understand your worth a little bit more, and then you're able to kind of tell people. Unfortunately, this is how much it costs, and a lot of people will kind of balk at that you know, that number, but it's kind of like, unfortunately, that's that's kind of the price of. Uh, the, the labor over the years and the work that you've done. So yeah, I, I didn't, I'm not too sure like um, how else you can kind of, like that's my experience. I just kind of do stuff digitally and invoice people and then they pay me. So that's, that's kind of cool. And you know, I've had a really good year. <laughs> to be honest, uh, I'm, working on, I'm working on a video game project with a AAA studio. Uh, I'm working, I just finished doing artwork for uh, a, film, a documentary with uh, GFC Films and Universal Pictures, and then I went to America, and then I landed this Disney gig. So, um, surprisingly, I've made six <laughs> figures over this year as an artist. Like, that's that's crazy <laughs> shit as an artist. To be honest, that's weird. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I donated it to a digital tour to uh, supply uh, laptops for the uh, underprivileged. Yeah. I wanted to just jump in really quickly, um, uh, talking about Moana Nui, one of the things that was so important for us in building a digital theatre is that we would have the space to hold, have a digital box office. So the, the, uh, the work that can be streamed from that digital theatre can be ticketed as well. And because it's all held within the digital space, it means that the access is easier for, for our communities, but also um, the overheads of a venue aren't the same as what it is when streaming from that space. So it means that our artists will then take home more in regards to box office. This is still a new space for us and we're growing it, but it's, um, it means that that's money that can go straight into the hands of our artists, their companies, their collectives, and that's been super important for us. I'll just be real quick. Um, but e even just like back to a, on a like really basic level, I think even if you're like a maker and you don't have a digital practice, even just like this sort of, I've been thinking about this like brown economy that's sort of happening 
where a lot of people are able to sell online and um, even places like Moana Fresh, who they have a physical store, but they also have an online presence and both are enmeshed. And the way that is sort of like this online collective that helps artists make um, money and, and also helps them keep creating. And so just in that really basic level, the online space is really helpful if you're like a, just a maker, a physical maker of things. Absolutely, and a lot more opportunities there. And Katrina, if I'll um, leave the last word for you, and we talked about, um, you, you, uh, you talked about um, uh, making a point about charging and just like you, Mikael, and I think um, it's really important for all of us to remember um, our, our, our value and the worth that we are um, offering up to others. So if you could um, just talk about that, thanks. Definitely agree with Mikkel. Um, a lot of the revenue that I've created has been from my arts practice. Um, I won't say how much, that's private. <laughs> but we're there, we're there. <laughs> and um, what I've learned over the years is just know your worth. And it's a huge, it's hugely important. I mean, I know as Pacifica people, it's like when somebody wants you to do something for them and, you know, it, it's hard to ask or it's hard to even say how much you charge. But for myself, what I've learned is I've learned what my worth is and I don't go below that. Um, and not only that, just learn the business. Like, there's a whole side of digital arts that is completely different from selling, you know, a physical painting. Um, and, yeah, just know your worth. Love it. Know your worth, everybody. Oh, um, just, just, just want to say, <laughs> even though I, I do make decent money as an artist, <laughs> I will sometimes do stuff for free for friends or for community stuff. Like it's it's not all about the money. Uh, so you know, sometimes you <laughs> sometimes you do stuff for the people. Like that's and that's and that's kind of I guess our our co papa in general yeah. is like we can if we can look after ourselves, we can also. Uh, volunteer our services for others as well. Let the go public. Thank right, you. So. And catch up with Mikkel afterwards to create your avatar. Thank you very much. I know that there's um, so much more that we could do. Um, there's so much knowledge um, and insight shared with this panel. We could talk so much longer. But thank you so very much for sharing your knowledge, your wisdom, your experiences. Um, yeah, we've, we've learned so much. Thank you. Big hand. Thank you. Stage right. Okay. I want to say thank you very much to media, to Faith, to Jessica, to Katrina, and to Mikkel. It's Mikkel's shout for drinks at 4.30. Uh, and um, thank you to Catherine for facilitating. Um, thank you for your patience, and I know we've gone over by about 10 minutes, but it's important that we needed to hear all the conversations today. I have four things left to share with you. Um, first of all, just some overall thoughts from uh, what's been a really fantastic day one. Thank you, everybody, for your contributions and participation. Um, three things in particular that um, I've been reflecting on. One is the importance of our history, our whakapapa, our papahanga, our ngafa, in terms of our collective journey as Pacific Arts in the Pacific Arts sector, and the importance of hearing from our leaders and where we've come from and how we've got to today. The second thing I've heard is the importance, and people have said it a number of different ways, but I think it probably came out in the uh, tour panel from Fornoti, is the importance of us all moving together, so particularly artists in Creative New Zealand, and working out what can we do together. Um, the third thing is, again, I've heard this a number of different ways, is that, and, and I asked this earlier on in the day, but people do have an appetite to have different sorts of relationships with us. So I was thinking about the afterpay thing for laptops, but I suppose the question it raises for me is how strong are our relationships with the private sector, with the tech sector, um, and what opportunities might there be there um, in terms of the digital moana uh, conversation. So just some thoughts amongst the other um, 100 thoughts going on in my head um, from the wonderful, rich conversation today. Uh, the second point I wanted to share is just about tomorrow morning. So um, tomorrow morning, you are going to be in the wonderful hands of the beautiful Felicia Brown Acton, who will be our host for the day. Um, so if we could have everybody here from about quarter to nine at the latest, ready to go sharp at nine o'clock, 
Um, tea and coffee will be available from quarter past eight here. And there's a little rumour that Breakfast TV might be shooting live from here tomorrow morning. Um, the third point is following this, uh, when we wrap up for today, for those who are interested, we're having a um, debrief session down at Max Brew Bar, uh, which if you don't know where that is, if you can follow Ali and Kavika, but basically just out right the front of Te Papa, behind the Circa Theatre, just over there, between 4.30 and 6.30. Um, Creative New Zealand be really pleased to host all of you there. A chance to reflect together on the day and enjoy some, enjoy some more time together. Um, finally, and most importantly, it's my uh, pleasure to invite the Reverend Suamalia to come and to close us for today. Thank you, everybody. It's a beautiful day today, and it's good when we come to the end of the program. We have been talking about leadership. We have been talking about the evaluation of our achievement in the past until today, and then we are looking with the post to the goalpost where we are journeying to the future for our children. I would just like to connect our heart to the Word of God that will enlighten us before we leave this place here. This is proverb speaking to us tonight. Guard your heart with vigilance, for it determines the course of your life. Heart is the very essence of our life. And we need to connect our heart to the source of life. And if we connect well to the spiritual world, the spiritual world will enlighten our pathway, our dreams, our vision, our strategy. Why? because the spiritual world see 10, 20 years ahead of us, we can only see a month or six months. But if we connect our hearts with vigilance to his heart, he will be able to determine the cause of our journey. Let us be connected with the work that we do, connected well with the spiritual world, connected well with the moana. Build our relationship, our va, our waka, and travel. Don't forget also to remember, save Tuvalu to save the world because of the climate change. This is my song that I always take with me. We talk about the well-being of our people. Art is to save your children. And if we can't save Tuvalu from the climate change, we can save our family and our world. Let us pray. It's a joy for us, Heavenly Father, to come as your people, to celebrate our success in the past, that enable us to stand tall today and think big of tomorrow. And we are challenged to connect our heart to the spiritual world that refashion our way to navigate us to a better place for tomorrow. We also pray for the security of our nations we pray for the issues of climate change. And we also remember all the artists here in Aotearoa, and especially those who are leading us. Bless our strategy and bless us as we 
move away from this place here. We ask for your journey mercies to be with us. In your name, the name of God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a blessed evening. Manuya.